What's up, everybody? Hi, guys. How's it going? How we do? Topping off, I'm topping off my Burger King Coke. You're getting caffeinated up, are you? I am. We're uh, we're watching Alex sugar himself up. That's right. Let's see who we got hanging out today. We got uh, we got our boy Vince. What's up, Vince? Yo, Anthony's in chat. Hi, Miranda. We got Laura, Mr. Keith, Jack in the shop. What's up, Jack? Jackie boy. Let's see. Madly crafty. Hello from Alaska. What's up? What up? Hello from Laser Everything. We got Bronson. What's going on, guys? How we all doing? What's up? What do you got so, going on over there, Alex? We're continuing uh, our configuration today. I have, a, I have a full shelf. I have like 30 lenses that need to be configured from scratch. And uh, if you're not familiar with it, underneath us right here down that way is uh, the spreadsheet that we made. It's not quite done, which is why I haven't put it on the LMA yet, but I will be putting it on the LMA uh, for tracking just your machine and lens configurations and how they combine to lead to different light burn settings in software. So it's like kind of a big tracker so you can track all of that stuff. It's got a ton of stuff in it like, uh, you know, which axis is your X axis? What kind of expander are you using? Your jump and delay and red dot offset settings. Uh, information about your laser sources, uh, your field size, the actual focal distance that you measure, the spot size, your lens corrections. So it, it literally has everything that you could possibly need if like everything digital in your life exploded tomorrow, Kyle, then you could look at this graph. Yeah, I'll let you tell that story in a second. Yeah, we'll uh, get there. You, you, you could look at this chart, rather, and... Uh, Basically, you could just in 10 minutes, you could have your entire setup fixed. Uh, so we're working on filling that out for me because these lasers have been moved and jumbled and rustled and wrestled so many times that uh, they just they all need to just be set up from scratch. So I dumped my entire light burn library and we're rebuilding all of it from nothing uh, in order to start on like a level playing field. So. Uh, a few episodes ago, we did. We started with the CO2 Galvo. Uh, we did the 140 lens and the 70 millimeter lens for that. Uh, then we decided we were going to do the UV, but then it had an EasyCAD board, an EasyCAD 3 board in it. So we had to downgrade that to an EasyCAD 2 board. But then when we plugged it in to it's test it, we found... Yeah, it is an upgrade. Uh, when we started testing it, we found out there was actually an issue with the way that we had wired something. It works a little differently than when you're doing a uh, fiber laser downgrade. So we spent the next day live streaming, uh, showing the fix for that. And now today we're finally back on track. Uh, we're gonna do, I'd like to get through a couple UV lenses if I can, or at least one more. I got the 110 done before the show and uh, I really wanna do the 70 now. I tested the spot size on the 110. It was 0 0.03 millimeters, which is just like mind bogglingly small it's about 850 dpi which is nuts uh so i'm really interested to see what the 70 outputs so i'll probably start with 70 millimeter lens on the uv today i also haven't done any for the fiber yet so we may do a fiber one too uh and then kyle you're gonna be doing some config as well right i am yeah i'm gonna finish up my lunch here while we're we're hanging out and you're getting started but i will be doing some lens corrections some timing and delay settings and doing my focal points on a bunch of lenses. And the reason why is kind of funny. Um, I had Lightburn open and I had my computer blue screen on me during stream the other day. Rip. And what ended up happening was Lightburn lost all the configs. Not only did it lose the configs, but the configs I had backed up didn't have any of the values I needed. It didn't have any of the timing, the delay, any of that stuff saved. So I went to an older backup and it didn't have it either. So either I've been overriding the wrong backups or or uh, something else happened. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, 
So uh, aside from the, the physical hardware issue I was having with my computer, which is now fixed, um, I'm essentially starting from basically scratch. I have I have the Mark Config 7 files that came with the original EasyCAD 2 software packs with all the lasers, but nearly none of them are like fine-tuned. And I was going to say, how good is that data, you know? Not great. Um, three of the lasers, the lens corrections are, are fine, uh, but only two of them uh, have built in, like, they're not using a core file. They're using actual values. Uh, the Wisely one uses core files, which I want to move away from for comparison's sake, because I want to be able to take that data and compare it if I move those lenses to another machine. So just for keeping things consistent, I am redoing everything from scratch. Um, I also are you going to do? Are you going to do all of your lens corrections natively in Lightburn? Yes. Um, I'm. It well the the tool is is pretty much good, um, and even when it comes to scale, you can. I mean, there's a tool to fix that if it's off. So I'm not really concerned about that. Um, you can get totally legit values from it, and. Um, I just want I want the data points. I don't want to function off of a core file at this point. I want to yeah. know what the values are so I can compare that lens on one machine to another. Uh, maybe that doesn't necessarily mean anything to other people who are fine tuning their machines, but at least from our standpoint, that's valuable data. Um, yeah. <laughs> Bronson says, I'm sorry for your loss, Kyle. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I saw it, that. It's okay. It needed to happen anyway. Now it's just a kick in the pants to actually do it. Um, also, shout out to uh, Rob and Andrew and Jason who joined us in the chat there. Good speaking of Rob, I have a box from you, buddy. Yeah, you it, do. Maybe well, we'll incorporate you wanna, a little you wanna, unboxing. You should do it. You should just, uh, you're going to need it today. True. True. Yeah, um, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll work that in in like 15 minutes. So um, if you I just that, really you quick. Out. So I can walk away from this. I just wanted to show off. This is the normal 110. These are both UV fused silica UV F theta lenses. And this is the 110 millimeter. And this is the 70. And I just like, look how much extra glass you need for the 70 just to be able to get the spot that small. It's crazy. That's like a crazy big difference. It's maybe wild I'll, to me. Maybe I'll do, uh, I do have a 70 millimeter. Uh quartz lens that mm. I, I i've been meaning to configure for the 100 watt maybe i'll do that for the 60 because i'm starting on the 60 watt maybe yeah. i'll just go through all the lenses on the 60 first uh, we're also going to mark by the way guys we're going to start marking these lenses with serials i i did come up with a bit of a um serialization kind of like naming convention uh and we can talk about that before we actually even get started with anything and then I'm going to actually engrave these lenses with serial numbers that I can use to track them in the sheet. Uh, so when I am looking for a lens, I can match the lens to the focal uh, focal stick, and uh, I'll show I'll show some examples of that um, in just a second here. In fact, uh, Kyle, can you make the sheet big real quick, man? Absolutely. So one of the things uh, when you guys get a machine. Uh, a lot of people, when they come to us and they're asking questions, one of the first questions is like, what's my frequency range? And we're like, well, it depends on the model number of your source. And they read us the model number of like the machine as far as the OEM considers the machine. So um, that's not the model number of your source. If you're here today watching this, you probably know that. But like your machine as an OEM manufacturing the complete system give the entire system typically a model number, right? So here on the left side of the screen, you guys can see, uh, for example, the uh, CO2 Galvo that I have is manufactured by Mactron, and they give the entire system as a whole a model number of MTRF30, uh, right? So that's the Mactron Tech RF30 watt. Uh, and I decided, so as far as tracking serials go, because Remember, in order to make sure that we always have a focal stick paired with both a lens and a machine, because it matters, like if you have two fiber lasers, you can't take the focal stick from one 
for a 110 lens and use it on the other. So we have to keep those pairings separate. Uh, so I decided, why not use this model number? Unless you have two literally the same exact machine, using this model number won't be an issue for a tracking serial. And if I did, for some reason, get a second one of these MTR F30s, I could just call it MTR F31 and MTR F32. So uh, for the tracking serial, for the machine, we're going to be going with the model number. It's already on the machine, so I don't have to engrave anything extra to uh, put onto it. And it should be unique for each machine that we have in the shop. Uh, scrolling over here, the other thing that we are working on tracking serials for uh, are our lenses. Now, a lot of these have kind of like arbitrary, weird serial numbers engraved on them. I'm sure you guys have seen them, uh, but we're not going to be using those. I want the value to mean something. I don't want it to just be like a random like lot and production date number. I want it to deliver some information about the lens. So uh, for the most part, this tracking serial co column here has been just kind of like a notes field so I can keep the lenses straight. But the UV that I just did, uh, I came up with what I'm going to do for the serialization of all of the lenses. So uh, here we have 355. So that's obviously the wavelength. So we know it's a UV lens. And then we have UVFS. And that's just short for UV fused silica. I want to note the material of the lens because maybe someday down the road, I'll get a sapphire UV lens. Right, and that is gonna require a different configuration with this machine. So in order to keep that separate, I'm including the material that that lens was made out of. And then we have our focal distance. This is the rated focal distance, 160, and our field size, 110. And the way that we're using all of these values together, guys, uh, and let me just switch the camera really quick so I can show you kind of like where this is gonna end up. There we go. So it's just the UV laser bed. But here is uh, the first focal stick, guys. And you can read that right there. So we have the model number of the machine. That's our tracking number for the machines, remember. So MT-UV5, that's the Mactron Tech UV laser source, 5 watts. And then we have that serial number that I just broke down for you on the sheet. And then at the very end, we have 214 millimeters that's the length of this focal stick. So we have an exact machine paired with an exact lens and then the focal length of the stick. And I think that this means that you will never grab the wrong stick. Uh, you'll never be out of focus because this is a specific machine paired with a specific lens. So one of the last things we have to do to get this system to work is actually mark that serial number on the lens in question. Now, it's not a huge emergency for me right now because I only have a single 110 millimeter lens for the UV, but it could be a problem down the road. So I wanna make sure that I start serializing these lenses now. Uh, I'm not gonna mark the lens right away. We're gonna start with some configuration today, but uh, by the end of this stream, we should have at least a handful of lenses engraved with their serial numbers, configured in Lightburn and added to the sheet. So, that is part of the uh, the goal here for today. That's the end of my triad. Hey, Anthony joined us. Hey. Anthony. What's up, big man? Hey, what's up, guys? Not much. What's Just stay plugging away. Word. <clears throat> Are you going to do one of these sheets, dude? You should probably do one of these. You have enough machines. Yeah, I probably should. What is that as? Is that on the downloads page on the? Uh, no, I haven't Elmate? published it yet. I'm gonna put it on the LMA later, but I'll share it with you now. Oh, okay. Sweet. What's your work email? Did you have like a business email? Yeah, it's uh, Anthony at beamituplw.com. Lw.com. All right. Cool. Here you go. Shooting it over to you now. Uh, I made you an awesome. editor nice so you can make a copy of it, but don't don't overwrite my stuff. Okay. <laughs> Make sure you like, you can drop it down. I don't know. Kyle knows how to do it. You can ask Kyle. You can like drop a thing down and say like make a copy and it'll like copy it into your drive. <sighs> um, all right. So first thing I'm going to be doing today and then I'll let Kyle talk about his setup and where he's going. Um, 
the first thing I'm going to be doing is I've, I've installed the 70 millimeter lens in the UV. I'm going to get my little triangle and I'm going to find the focal distance for this lens. So uh, I'll be doing that in the background. If you have questions about that, feel free to ask them in chat. Otherwise, I'll be plugging away on that. And in the meantime, uh, it's all you, Kyle. Um, what I'm doing is just prepping a couple things before I get started. Kyle's like, damn you. <laughs> I'm not ready yet. What are you, what are you doing, Anthony? I'm just wrapping up some more of the swag for this restaurant that, uh, that mm. I'm going to work for. So I actually Ooh, saved this awesome. last one right here. I'm doing some keychains for them and I designed them to look like the sign that I made for them for the front of this restaurant. So nice. I cut these tags out with a uh, CO2. And then because the dot size, like you said, just a, a couple minutes ago on the UV is so small, I can actually Dude, yeah. have it cut those out right there without sacrificing. I tried doing this on the uh, CO2 and the letters would just break off because the dot size was too large. Yeah. So most of these, as soon as yeah, I man. pick them up, these letters are just falling straight out. Boom. I'm like now we super got amped to see what the dot size is on the 70. Matt had a guess. Matt was guessing. Uh, Matt was guessing point zero two two. I think was his guess, which I can't measure that small, but point zero two is the target. We'll see. All right. So I'm going to assign the seventy millimeter a serial number three fifty five UVFS one hundred seven. So just catching up on chat while I'm still sitting here. So DJ Raven says, just so you know, I blame you guys for buying my new fiber laser. And we have to have it on people. Sorry. Yeah. Congratulations on your new laser, though. I hope you enjoy it and have fun with it and, you know, do all the, the crafty maker things. Mitch says, what's up, guys and gals? What's up, bud? Hey, 3D HP Jerry's in the house. What's up, man? I apologize. I cannot read acrylic because I'm not that talented, but hello. Um, where can I conf where can I find a configuration for CCAD 20 watt runs Liper and under Rakus? Um, you can't yet. Um, so Lipern is working on incorporating CCAD and BSL support. Um, I believe that's not coming until 1.7. I believe it's in beta still. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, is that on it, public beta right now? I don't believe it's on public beta, but if it is, you can literally just search Lightburn public beta, yep. and you'll you'll see their news article. Just read through the change log. It'll list if it's there. If it's not there, it's probably in the next version. Um, yep. But I know, I know they announced they're working on it um, in one of their news releases. <clears throat> yeah, which is awesome. Dude. A lot of people yeah there's there's a lot of people who have c yeah. boards uh there's a lot of actually the, um a lot of those diode lasers the, like the they're similar to the f1 so there there's oh man there's the one that starts with a g jin 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 mitsu, jin, jin mitsu. Jin yeah yeah jin mitsu. and then there's the the one that starts with a z that i can't remember there's like four or five brands that all have um it's like a two watt fiber module and they're designed to be like an ultra lightweight machine that you can literally just pick up and move to the other side of the room with like three fingers. Mm -hmm. Um, they weigh like maybe 10 pounds. Um, they're a, a lot of the target audience for those are like people who go to marketplaces and stuff, but a lot of them because they're budget machines and the controllers are, I'm, I'm guessing much cheaper. It's been quite a while since I've looked them up. But BSL boards, which use CCAD, they're not quite fully com compatibilized, if you want to say it that way, uh, into Lightburn as of yet. Uh, but they've been working on it. They've been working hard at it. And I think they'll have something for us on the next update on that. Unfortunately, um, well, and fortunately, I guess, I guess it's both. I don't have a CCAD board to even remotely try and test that. Yeah, me either. Um, 
or do I have a machine that has one in it? So I don't have much to contribute there. Um, but hang tight and watch for Lightbird news articles on that. I'm sure they will be screaming it from the rooftops because a lot of people have been waiting on that. Check out how clear the focal point is with the 70 millimeter lens. Oh, uh, let me let me make yeah, like that. You can see it from like a mile away. It's pretty crazy. Yep. Um, so I'm gonna use this pick here, and I'm actually gonna scratch across where I want to measure the focal distance from, just because when you're when you're sitting down here and you're trying to get that uh, ruler to line right up with the focal distance, it can be a little hard to see because the ruler's in the way. So I find just like adding a tiny little scratch at the level I want to stop measuring uh, can really help me. Also, and Kyle will be showing this off a little later in probably a little more detail, uh, shout out to Rob at We Do Widgets for crafting these little focal distance finders. These things are rad. Uh, they're super easy to use. You just put the top end on your lens and you move the bottom one down to your focal point and you tighten the screw here by my thumb and then you read it and it tells you exactly what your focal distance is. It's very, very handy. I've been using this nonstop during the reconfiguration process. So you guys will see me using this a lot today. And I'm gonna uh, be I'm gonna be unboxing that and giving it a go here in a little bit too. I think do we still Rob, if you're in the chat, do we still need a link to Rob's Etsy store where he sells these? We we need yeah, we need a, a place where we can we can link to for that. So yeah, Rob so please let us know. Email us or I don't I don't think YouTube will let you drop it in chat, but you have our emails. Hit us up. Um, so we can get that linked. So uh, anybody looking yeah. for it knows where to go. Um, William says, I just need to find where to get all the right configs for the factory since the software is crap compared to Lightburn and can find all the info like I could with Diode. Yeah, it's... Uh, CCAD is very much... Uh, it's essentially easy CAD just with a different coat of paint. And it's not even yeah. a better or a worse coat of paint. It's essentially the same software. Um, in some cases, it, it might run even crappier, but either way, not awesome. Um, Definitely handy, though, when trying to config it, because you can watch any of our tutorials, uh, yeah. and any of our video series on getting EasyCAD set up, and 99.9% .9 of it, with the exception of, like, some menu locations, you know, where certain things are hidden in menus, uh, it's going to be a one-to-one. -one. So yep. um, you may just have to look a little bit to find different options that we talk about during the series. But outside of that, I mean, all of our setup videos and tutorials should be uh, very relevant to you. Okay. Um, and so essentially, uh, yeah, hang, hang tight. When they, when they have full support out for BSL boards for uh, CCAD, I'm also hoping that the Mark Config 7 import will work, which will make Config a little easier for you, too, as a first-timer. So you, you'll have options. You'll get there. Just uh, You'll just have to hang out while they get that situated with Lightburn with getting support rolled out. Yep. Um, Rose says, what luck. I'm taking a break from looking for my first fiber. Well, welcome. Thanks for hanging out. It's a, it's a good welcome, time welcome. To, uh, to be chilling and... Especially good if you're getting ready to buy your first fiber. You get to see the, the setup process in action. Resin Dragon uh, Studios has hanging out as well. What's up? Can we get that question by Rose up about the this may see dumb? Oh, yes. Uh, so Rose says this may seem dumb, but the uh, is the X Tool F1 a real fiber, quote unquote? It seems to do the same thing, but no one can tell me if it does coins or thicker brass plates. It'll mark them, Rose. Um, it's not going to engrave them. So you're not going to be like really ablating material with that uh, with that laser. The X1 is a super cool, super capable machine if you're using it for what you're supposed to be using it for. But it's only a two watt module in there. And I am looking at your question about it being a real fiber in that like real fiber optic 
fiber lasers have fiber optics in them, which is just like they're glass ropes, basically, and they're doped with special elements that react with the light in a way that it gives off 1064 nanometer light. Uh, the Xtool F1, I believe, I can't confirm this, I believe, to the best of my knowledge, is a semiconductor laser. So it's a, it's a diode that's giving off the same wavelength. So I don't think that the beam is being generated the same way as in a quote unquote real fiber. And even if it was, uh, it's still two watts, right? It's a two watt laser. So, you know, when we're looking at the fiber laser floor on a professional scale as like 20 watts, this is a 10th of that power. And that 20 watts is usually the floor we recommend for anybody for pretty much any use. Uh, so where is the value in something like the x F1? It's gonna come in uh, with the wavelength, right? You're getting that 1064 nanometer light in your laser beam and different materials absorb that better or worse than the 455 nanometer blue light that you usually find on a diode laser. So um, yes, you can mark things like uh, brass plates or coins. You can certainly leave a mark on them. You can do laser marking. But if you're looking to do laser engraving, uh, you're going to definitely want something substantially more powerful than what the uh, F1 is going to be able to offer you. So hopefully that hopefully that answers your question. It's a, it's a cool machine, does a lot of really neat things, but it's not super good for engraving and ablating away material is the short answer. Yeah, not not really intended to be just surface marking. Yeah, it's definitely more fiber-like, as you said uh, in chat, Rose. It's definitely more fiber-like in that they share a wavelength uh, rather than capabilities. Yep. Um, William says, the G2 one of you reviewed is CCAD. Uh, we did not get a G2. A G2? Uh, it's, uh, I believe that's the Gweek, uh, um, like... Uh, 20 watt, I think it was, yeah, yeah, or something like that. Yeah, we didn't get one of those. Um, the 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 most budget machine that we got was the com marker B4 20 watt with a max source. Uh, and we had the that was like uh, a 2005 watt EM Smart, the basic 2R, would be yeah, the other one. Both of those are uh, easy CAD boards, though, easy CAD 2 boards, yeah custom max sources yep uh, uh I, Rob says I don't know he if my... sent it to one of our email addresses okay cool so we'll um, we'll get that i don't know if my screen is up is my screen up your no we're Doesn't looking at big. the laser you want the uh, screen it's just my computer screen yeah yeah um i'm just gonna make a focal stick really quick so i measured the, uh, the focal distance there with Rob's tool, which is awesome. Shout out again to Rob. Uh, I'm going to open this file right here. Uh, that's for gantry. Let's see. Uh, fiber focal stick, small. There's an SVG. That should do fine. You can get these on the project database page on our website, guys, um, if you need these to cut. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and set the height here. Luckily, I wrote it down because I've already forget forgotten what it was. It's 135 millimeters. The kerf with this wood on this machine is about a half millimeter. So I'm going to make this uh, 136. That'll be a half millimeter for the top and a half millimeter for the bottom or a half millimeter for the left and a half millimeter for the right. So uh, that should end up being a nice 135 millimeters for us. Uh, when we cut it. The other thing we need to do is we need to serialize this. We don't want to forget to serialize this. So uh, we're going to take another look here. I've crafted the serial number for this, 355 UVFS. It's a uh, focal distance of 100 and a working area of 70 millimeters. So we're definitely going to need that. So I'll copy that. And we'll drop that into here. And then, uh, not quite done, we need the serial number for the machine this stick is being made for, which is going to be the Mactron Tech UV 5 watt, so we'll copy that as well. 
and we're going to actually drop that in before the lens serial right there. And then the last thing we need to add is the length of the stick so that we can easily replace it if it gets damaged or something without having to look it up. So uh, we've got the Mactron Tech UV 5 watt, and then it's for the lens 355 UV Fuse Silica, uh, and it's the 100, uh, F equals 100 70 by 70 millimeter lens. And our measured focal distance is 135 millimeters. So once we have all that information together, we can just go ahead and drop that here onto the stick. Let's make sure it's nice and centered. And let's make sure that we're marking first and cutting second. And we should be good to go. So I can send this over to the Mira. We'll put the same wood that we've been using in the machine and uh, we'll chop that up real quick. Yeah. So is wood your preferred material? Or? Uh, no, I typically like acrylic. I think it warps a little less, but I don't have huge chunks of acrylic in an appropriate thickness laying around, and I have a bunch of eighth-inch wood. So gotcha. uh, I'm just throwing some eighth-inch on there just to get it just to get it done. I can always cut new sticks later. Yeah, sure. But I've just got so much eighth-inch like just kind of like cheese wood laying around. Yeah, I um, I don't I'm, I don't really have a, a situated material as of yet. The couple I've made have been out of quarter inch uh, birch ply. But um, if you don't make them wide enough, they they do tend to warp. Yeah, Even definitely that, not a, a long term solution. I I yeah. had when I when I moved to Rochester from California, right when I left. Uh, Michael and I, I wasn't working for Michael's shop anymore. He gave me to bring to New York like 50 sheets of like scrap, just like transparent red acrylic. And it was like, I, it was like a, a quarter inch. I mean, it was like just beefy red transparent acrylic. And um, I went through all of it just in my time running the shop and then in my time starting the channel. And then during the channel's growth and like all the new machines, I literally burned through all of that material. That's what I was using for the longest time. I don't have any more of it. So I'll probably special order some just for focal sticks and uh, go back to acrylic at some point. But for now, the wood is going to have to do. Yeah. Um, let's see. He says, watching this at work. So yeah, I'm definitely watching and taking background mental notes. We call that passive learning, man. Love it. That's that's how we do. And Rose says, "Thank you for the science. It sounds like just not enough oomph for what I want. I put real fiber because people are marketing it as fiber light." Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That's fair. Um, Vince wants to know if this is taking the place of the Tuesday night live. No, 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 no. I mean, just like I'm doing this today because I just I need to get some of this done. Uh, and I, I don't have time to do the podcast right now. Uh, it it kind of sucks, but I just like I've put I've kept putting this off and putting this off and putting this off. And I need to have my machines configured so that they can be used for videos and like shop work and just everything. And I don't, I don't have like any working lasers right now. It's a, it's a big problem. So um it's just like a temporary priority. The podcast is not going anywhere. Uh, I just have to prioritize this for at least the next week, at, at the least, until I get through these lenses and kind of get these machines up and running. So uh, very much temporary podcast is always going to be here, 100%. Yep. And Rose is asking, I was going through the backlog of videos. You had two on bringing a laser to a craft show and said a third will come. I cannot find a third. Um, I don't remember if there was one stuck in editing still, but uh, oh, is it that, the that's a, yeah, that's uh, a that's a work in progress one as well, though. That's just yeah, an ongoing effort. Uh, I know Matt was waiting for the for bit. Matt was kind of waiting for the weather to get a little better. Yeah, uh, in Florida, and then, um, but I believe we're edited up to date on that series, so um, okay. I'm sure Matt will finish it out. He really was very, very excited to be able to do that series. And he still has the laser 
uh, the comm marker he was going to use for it. Yep. So I would definitely be expecting um, that to finish at some point for sure. Yeah, it's definitely definitely not over. More to come. I actually have to cut a new focal stick because the one that I just cut wasn't wide enough. Oh, for the uh, for the, the, lens, the lens for the bottom of the lens. Yeah, yeah. I didn't scale it right, so cutting another one. A common whoopsie. That is what drew me to the car marker, your series. Yeah, I mean, it's a nice little laser. Um, I'm, I'm hoping they implemented some of the feedback that I sent them because that was a pre-production unit. Uh, we sent them a lot of, of feedback, and we discussed it in that original live stream where I put it together. Um, I'm, uh, I'm really hoping they, uh, they finished implementing all that. We never really got feedback, um, so I'd love to, to hear what you think of yours. How you doing over there, Anthony? Oh, just living the dream, man. Um, my wife's been telling me she wanted to make me a front door sign, like a fine you know, with a cricket, like a, one of those vinyl bills, so I can stick it to my front door, with like hours of operation and stuff like that. But I haven't yeah. done that, or she hasn't done that yet. So I'm making a wooden sign. There's a lot of times I haven't been able to get my CO2 to fit through this door yet. <clears throat> I'm going to have to either turn it on its side or its back and then slide yeah. through the door. So um, that's going to require a bunch of work to do that. But So some days I have to work from home, so I'm just kind of putting a sign up with our business hours, but then putting my phone number and uh, email address in case somebody comes while I'm gone. Yeah, it's been a while since I've the length of the stick and making sure that we didn't have like an issue with curve or anything. Uh, we want to make sure that this is exactly the length that we want it to be. And it's measuring perfectly uh, 135 millimeters. So uh, this stick should be good to go. We should be able to use this one. So now that we have our focus, we can go ahead and start doing things like our lens corrections uh, and red light adjustments if we need to. So. Uh, yay, second focal stick serialized, which is awesome. That's a, that's a big deal. Yeah. Woo. Progress. I lost the first one already. I don't even know where the first one is. Let me get this off of here. Where did my first... Focal stick go. I don't know. Oh, out of the box. Cool. Little family. Look at the focal distance difference between the 110 oh, and the 70. Right here. It's a big, it's a big glass difference. Oh, we couldn't even see that. That's a box. No, I had to switch switch cameras. I thought we were on the multi view. Um, when I was measuring, guys, I just had my clear acrylic ruler. We talked about this in a live stream a couple days ago uh, to verify that we were hitting the 135. That's all That's all they missed there. Uh, but yeah, look at that difference. That's a fair bit, man. Are you gonna be going through and doing um, your correction and all that now that you have your focal distance? Uh, yeah, yep, that's what's next. The computer's still over at the mirror, so I have to unplug it and roll it back over here. But Are yeah, you, that is. I, I'm assuming you're also gonna validate your uh, your timing and delays or no you already set that up um i haven't set that up for this machine yet i'll probably that'll be like the last thing i do after all of the lenses are done then we can do time yeah, I mean, that, that's that just once that's not lens yeah that should that's not should that shouldn't be lens specific yeah yeah so we'll do that at the end if, if not on today's stream definitely on the on the next one 
we have a really really good video about that though that is one of the few videos that hasn't been like outdated by software in some way or another all of our videos are definitely still like watchable and you can definitely still learn how to do the stuff that you're trying to learn how to do from them uh but a lot of them have like small inconsistencies from software updates and stuff that one is not one of those i, I think that one's still really clear and easy uh to follow along with so yeah the only the only thing in terms of timing and delay that you'll need to know the difference of if you're doing it in lightburn is you you don't get a check mark to add a contour line you have to add it as a sub layer right. so you just double click on the layer hit the little plus button and then you add a line set your settings the same and it's otherwise identical process yeah Rose says, uh, it looks like they did take your advice. 60 watts supposedly has a plate to stop the dust in the screw holes now. And also orange shield in front. Don't know about the 30 watt, which is what I am thinking. Awesome. Well, it's definitely good to hear that they seem to have implemented some of the, the advice. I, I mean, I, I, I consolidated all the, the things I found and I think it was like a four or five hour stream. Um, I took notes. I watched that back, took notes, and sent them a really long email. Um, it was very thorough. So I'm uh, I'm hoping for the better of the community. Uh, that's the case. That's awesome. So I think one of the things. Uh, can you throw me up back up on the PC again? Yes, sir. I think yet another use for this sheet that we're working on, guys is that we have our tracking serial for our machine and our lens. And the entire point of this is to know how those devices are paired, um, how they're paired up. Right now with my existing library setup, I just have Mactron, the model number, the source and the 110. And I don't really love that. I, I kind of want to do this with the serialization so I know exactly which machine and lens pair I've set this profile up for. Yep. So I'm gonna export this current setup uh, and we're going to... You can edit it before in. you change the name too, if you want. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll, I can do that. Uh, also, just gonna come over here really quick. And we're going to grab our serial number for the machine. So I'm going to hit copy on that. And we'll paste that in. So now I have a machine code and a lens code. And I'll save. And then we can just import that back in. So now we have that. And we'll hit open. And this is how... Uh, Oh, was that just the file name? So we'll that's just the file name. That's what I was saying. So if you go through, hit next, next. Yep. You can just change the name there, and then you're done. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. All right. Um, so let's. We have to grab our lens serial again. I get what you're saying. So let's grab this again. Copy. So now I can tell. Like now I know a ton of information about this machine. I think the only thing that this doesn't tell me is the source i know it's a five watt uv but i don't know who makes it but i suppose that doesn't really matter because we have the sheet so if i ever put a new source on this uv laser uh i would obviously create like some new rows or columns in the sheet to reflect that so i think this is a i think this is a pretty good setup i know exactly what machine and what lens this Lightburn profile is designed for. And of course, this isn't a 110, it's a 70. So let's go ahead and set that to 70 by 70 and finish. And there we go. So this will be uh, kind of how things look going forward. And of course, we'll apply that to all the SFX profiles. We'll apply that to all the previous Mactron profiles. Uh, and this should work really great. So um, I don't really know where I was going with that, but I'm, I'm, happy about it it's also easier to read these huge names down here in the bottom right corner are just getting like truncated and uh this fits perfectly that's excellent so we can just select that and looky there 
All right, let's get this lens calibrated. Yeah, I got to tell, I don't know, somebody at Lightburn that this doesn't work. New focal stick. Kyle, could you uh, set us back to the four window view, please? Yeah, buddy. Thank you. We got Anthony over there working on his sign. Oh, no. Did you? <laughs> I'm having the same 70 millimeter problem over here that I was having the other day. Rip. Tower doesn't go down far enough. So I'm going to have to raise, raise up, up your uh, bed. Yeah. Yep. All right. Let's see what we can we do. We got to get you a Z table or something. Yeah. It's fine. I've got, got workarounds around every corner. And this is why you don't throw away all of your scrap. That should be plenty. That should be plenty of height right there. Hopefully it's level. It should be level enough. If it's not, you'll know it with the UV. Yeah, sure will. Even a, a 150 has like a ridiculously small focal range. So that 70 is so tight. Yep. Yep. Did you uh, guesstimate the, the the height difference there in your focal range um, when you were doing the, the the little angle test? Yeah, I just kind of did it by eye. The first one was pretty far off, but I could see where it was coming into a focal point. Yeah. And then from there, I just raised it up another 20 millimeters or so. And what do you got, like maybe bit. two millimeters? Uh, On the 70? Yeah. At the best. One. At one best. Yeah. Yeah. It's tight. It's very tight, for sure. If you guys are enjoying hanging out, <clears throat> smash that like button. It uh, tells YouTube the, the content is at least decent and you're enjoying it. And it gets it in front of other people. It's like, man, why won't my laser thing like frame now? It's not the... Nine point correction is in framing and the laser wasn't plugged in to the computer. Rose is asking, does the lens size change the kerf offset needed? So kerf is usually when you're cutting through something. Um, with Galvo, it's already kind of a weird subject because you're cutting at an angle because you're projecting from a central point outward. So if you're cutting for example, like unless you're cutting straight down, and then moving the item by hand, you will always have a significantly larger kerf simply because right. you're going to have a beveled edge, um, if you want to think of it that way. But um, e uh, a different lens size can change your kerf. Um, did it end up meeting on all four corners there? It's it's dimmer, but it's it's definitely measurable. Okay. Yeah. Um, so like uh, that that's often why you won't hear about kerf when it comes to Galvo machines because they're not really designed to cut, but you can use them for some cutting. Uh, it just depends on what you want to do. Um, but yes, so. With a larger lens, you're going to get a larger dot size. Uh, and this is in generalities. I'm, I'm just talking if you have one laser and you go from a small lens to a big lens, your dot size when you're at focus will be physically larger because you're spreading that dot out. Um, so you're going to have a naturally larger dot size in focus. Um, and if you're out of focus, you're you're blowing up the dot size even more regardless of the lens you're using anyway. Uh, but um, to the same degree, uh, if you were to go over to like a CO2 gantry machine uh, and you wanted to cut out like a wood project, uh, your thickness of wood is going to have a big impact on your kerf 
if you're using a short lens versus a big lens because you're going to have um i call it the hourglass effect so your lens if you make like an x it has an hourglass shape to it uh so when as you go in and out of focus your physical beam dimension hitting the the, the material gets larger as you come into focus it gets smaller and then it goes back to being bigger again because well, a great video to crop. visualize that if yeah. you haven't already seen it is uh, everything you need to know about gavel lasers on our channel we have like a really nice um just like graphic that shows that in a convenient way yeah um but that's essentially um why that's affected it's the same same concept on a galva laser um but so if you were cutting with like a four inch lens on a CO2 gantry, you will have a bigger dot size, but it's going to be more consistent if you're cutting thicker material. That's why it's suggested if you're cutting really thick stuff that you move to a bigger lens because it'll keep your edge uh, consistency much more consistent. Um, I hope that makes sense. But if you have any questions, feel free to drop it in chat. You uh, shouldn't be cutting with a Galvo laser. All of that said, it's yeah, it's, it's just really a job for a tool. gantry. Yeah. yeah, they do make fiber gantries. They're fiber cutters. Uh, typically, they use a gas assist. So, if for example you're cutting out like jewelry all the time, um, you that could do it on a Galvo. It's just not ideal, and it's going to have a lot of post processing because you're going to have a lot of beveled and jagged edges. But if you go over to like a fiber cutter. It's going to be a lot cleaner and it's going to take a fraction of the time um, because you have a gas assist to help you. It's designed for that. Um, Yester says, will you test a 3D fiber laser with dynamic focus? Um, someday. Someday I'm sure we will, but we don't have one, so we can't do it. <laughs> uh, Alex actually just moved this machine that he's doing the testing on over to EasyCAD 2 from an EasyCAD 3 board, which was capable of 3D. But the reason why, I mean, aside from the desire to use Lightburn, obviously, um, that 3D controller was kind of being wasted on that laser in the sense that um, it wasn't a 3D laser. It didn't have a dynamic head, and it didn't have Z-axis control. Um, so... He was just better off switching it over to Lightburn for the ease of use. Um, I would have had to give BJJCZ like another thousand dollars for either of those EasyCAD three boards that I have anyway, because they're both they were both sold as two D boards. Uh, right. That too, yeah. Uh, they're uh, license locked out of their three D functionality. Not only that, but when you activate them a certain number of times, you actually have to. Um, you end up having to pay like a re-up fee um, because you can only activate the license so many times on different computers as well, which I'm sure Alex was nearing. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, Rose says hourglass is perfect. That is how I learned about curf years ago. I just did not know about the angle on the gallo. Yep. So yeah, think like uh, like a wall projector. Like if you're projecting your computer screen onto a wall with like a, an actual projector, um, you're going from a, a center focal point outward. And because of that, your, your beam angle is coming away from that center point. Yeah, the um, only point on that grid that you're projecting onto that will be a perfect straight down cut will be like zero comma zero. Every yeah. other point you're coming in at some kind of an angle from zero, zero outwards. Yeah. If you wanted like a perfectly straight down cut, you would need to like move it by hand, um, which would just be ridiculous. Um, Cause at that point you're basically using like a scalpel as a bandsaw. Um, it's going to be like hours of work. <laughs> yeah. Um, hard to find some reviews on dynamic focus Galvo, like field tech. It's Cause nobody buys uh, except them. company demos. Thanks. Yeah. They're, I mean, part of the barrier to entry to that is they're just really expensive. The other piece of that is they're going to 3D from a standard 2D 
so like a Lightburn compatible machine to a 3D, you're going, you're moving into proprietary softwares. So like you have field tech heads and then you have field tech, you have, um, what's the software again? Um, uh, 3DS. Yeah, you have uh, Landmark 3DS. Uh, there's uh, EasyCAD 3 for compatible dynamic heads with that. There's another one. Um, I can't remember the name. It's it's irrelevant, but they each have their own compatible software that works with means the head. all of those communities can't help each other. Yeah, they all have different software experiences, different problems, and the groups of them are so small. There's no central community like there is with Lightburn or even EasyCAD too, where okay. there's like a, just a massive number of people that have these systems. And so it's easy to find another person who's done what you, you're trying to do before and get help. And that really, really doesn't exist with 3D systems because there's so many different kinds. None of them work together and they all come with their own problems and really small support communities. You're basically sen sentencing yourself to rely on whoever sold you the machine to, to provide the support. It, it's rough. Yeah. The... Uh... So going back to barrier to entry too on cost between the, the, the Galvo head upgrade going from a 2D to a 3D, the controller, which they char usually charge an arm and a leg for, and then the getting the, the, the tower is kind of a minimal thing, but a couple hundred bucks for a motorized tower wired into the, control the controller, you're usually talking several thousand dollars of cost difference going from a, a normal 2D experience to a 3D experience. And the simple fact is for like most people's use case, 90% of people don't need 3D for what they even want to do, let alone what they need to do with it for business use. So it a lot of time just turns into a sunken cost situation where you get it and then never use it for 3D a lot of the time, which is just now you're adding you're adding delay to your to your workflow because you're working a 3D laser as a 2D laser and it has all that complexity built into it and you have to kind of work around that all the time. It's just more stuff that's in the way of what you want to use it for usually. Um, and stuff like in Lightburn, you have 3D height map where you simply just don't, you don't need 3D to get a 3D effect a lot of the time too. Um, Rose says, wow, 12K for a field tech on AliExpress or Alibaba. You weren't kidding about the price. Yeah. So for example, if you're buying a 60 watt fiber laser, like even like a, a nice high-end JPT 60 watt, which is, I mean, in a lot of cases, that's more than enough for pretty much anybody unless you're doing significant like deep work um, or a lot of like cutting or whatever. But um, a, a 60 watt machine you could get for between like five and seven grand typically, depending on what you want and your options and yada, yada, yada. Um, $12,000 is what Rose just said. And I mean, I, you're a lot of the time you're doubling the cost of the machine by going to 3d uh, just as a general thing it's just silly that's not even and again that's not even considering the time you're going to spend learning it and getting it set up without help which is how anybody who has one of those things learned how to use it because the support is pretty pretty barren yeah the it 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 gets to be a lot Money says you just have to know the right people. I have a 2.5D 100 watt JPT MOPA fiber coming with a rotary for around six grand. Um, I really hope you did your due diligence on making sure that brand is going to be around in a year if you need to warranty something. Um, and I also hope you did the due diligence on reading through their reviews or finding somebody else with who's had that brand of machine because that's substantially cheaper than the going rate for a 100 watt 2d machine um 
And I really hope they didn't cut corners on setting it up and wiring it or giving you used equipment and not disclosing it or refurbed equipment. Um, check it over thoroughly. Lightburn and spit out that weird rectangle during my scale test again. So I'm trying to fix that. Yeah. Jack in the shop paid over uh, just over four grand just for the hundred watt JPT source. So that that falls right into the you know, you need to sanity check the price, right? If the parts of, of the components cost far more than the machine would by itself, uh, you got a problem. Yeah, the machine should definitely not be less expensive than the sum of the parts. Yeah. So just our two cents. Do it that way you will. If it's anybody who's heard a lot of nightmare experiences, it's us. Because we're we help a lot of people. Dude, I'm so dumb. I was like, man, the UV's red light is really, really on point. I haven't needed to make a single adjustment. And then I was like, oh, wait, it uses the UV as the targeting laser. It's not going to be offset. Yeah. <laughs> it's always going to be perfect. Yeah. Yep. Hard to see, but always going to be perfect. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Kyle, I know you're answering a lot of questions, but you're not doing a lot of configuration over there. No, I'm not. Still reading. Chat's popping off. Cool. Again, guys, if you're enjoying hanging out, if you're getting value or just, you know, like the background noise, hit that like button. It helps out the channel, helps people see the, the stream. Cut corners are scary. Had a 3D printer where it, had a three prong connector to outlet, but there was no ground attached to the PSU, just cut wire <laughs> and epoxy at the end, not connected to anything. That is horrid. I've seen that so many times. Yeah. They don't give a shit. Um, one of the nightmare cases that I, I was saying is the, the person, I won't share names, got their laser. By the time they got their laser, the AliExpress or Alibaba store, I don't remember wh which platform it was on, had already been shut down. So by the time it was re received in shipping, they were gone. They couldn't be contacted. Uh, the, the, the contact was dead on the site. They couldn't get support through AliExpress or Alibaba because the store had been shut down. And they were stuck with a machine that didn't work. Uh, it literally had the the source cable was disconnected from the control board and shipping because it wasn't screwed in. Uh, nothing was properly wired or cable managed. It was literally a rat's nest. Um, nothing was cable channeled. Nothing was cable bundled. Uh, it, you, and everything was using the same two color wires across everything. So you had to trace every wire from beginning to end to know where it was going and come to find out that b the machine wasn't powering on because the, um, the slide over connectors that the power inlet was wired to weren't connected all the way. And it was just barely disconnected, but it was beginning to arc. Um, and it popped the fuse. Uh, the fuse had to be replaced in the in the plug of the machine, which is good because there was a bunch of wires that weren't connected inside the case. It was just horrid. Um, they turned into a wiring expert. It took them a couple weeks, but they got it fixed. But how much if is you your guys, time worth? If you guys are following along with me here, hey, Kyle, can you move Anthony up? with you and put my camera down next to my monitor. Yeah, all right, that makes more sense. Um, if you guys are following along with me, 
I just added all of my um, lens correction values that I got from Lightburn's native lens corrections into my spreadsheet. So you can see that in the red and blue sections there on the right. And now we're gonna just do a little spot size test. So now that all of this is done, I'm just gonna draw a small box. I'll put something like a half millimeter uh, interval on it and we're gonna mark it and then we'll take it over to the microscope and uh, take a measurement and see what kind of spot size we're getting on an anodized card, which is kind of my, it's kind of my baseline for getting spot size measurements. So that's what I'll be doing next. And you guys will be able to see that on the microscope in uh, just a minute here. Yeah. Rose said, so the machine was designed to make the guy get a new house. Pretty much. <laughs> if it if it didn't pop the fuse on the back of the machine, which thankfully that wasn't just, you know, a fuseless input or I've seen some companies just put a metal bar there so it will never pop. Um, yeah. And there, there have been instances we've had posts in the Discord and the Facebook or just emailed to us of people's who've had house fires from having crappy machines um, just inappropriately put together and not properly set up. And that's just physical. That's like having a laptop with a, like a faulty power connector, light your pants on fire. Any way to engrave relief on convex surface, not suitable for rotary without dynamic 3d dynamic focus. Um, I mean, technically you can still use 3d height mapping, uh, if you use a large enough focal range lens, I mean, you can use uh, project mark or, um, cylinder correction. Both of those would work to a degree. Yep. I use them on tapered cups all the time. It works fine. Yep. We have videos. Well, he, he's saying channel. specifically a relief engrave. Oh, a relief. Yeah. You can do a 3d. I guess we have a. On, if you on have a, a really card. powerful source, right? You could yeah. still do that. Yeah. Yeah, you can wattage. you can you can handle a light curve with like a 200 lens. And uh yeah, why not? Jack says Rakus is a Ford, JPT is a Dodge. I don't know about that. Uh JPT is a Honda and Rakus is a Toyota. Cybertruck. What did Anthony say? The JPT is a Cybertruck. The Cybertruck, <laughs> please. <laughs> uh, Mario says, "Do you guys ever DIY any machines, or are you just buying them outright?" Just curious. No. Um, <laughs> kind of. We do everything, Both? man. Um, yeah. Alex basically ripped apart this UV laser and used a wall work five volt three amp adapter for charging some random device as a replacement power supply to get his easy cad two board running because he didn't have a standard like mean well we did that two days ago um that's on stream if you want to go check it out uh yeah, it's a good stream. um maybe don't do that at home Super uh, but it works works really it, good it works um we do a lot of DIYing. Uh, we don't necessarily build everything from scratch, but we do a healthy mix. The machine back there, pointing is hard. Uh, the blue machine back there, which I affectionately call the blue poo. Uh, the old blue poo. The only things original in it are the motors, most of the gantry, and the laser tube, and the case. I've pretty much rewired everything. Um, all the power supplies got replaced. Uh, some of the, the the wiring from the wall inlet to the inside of the machine got replaced. Uh, just a chaos. Um, hence the, I'm speaking from experience of buying a very budget machine that probably just shouldn't have been a purchase. Um, did it work? Yes. But how long did it work for? About three months before it died. Kyle, I'm yeah. not gonna focus the I'm not gonna focus the ruler yet. Matt guessed point zero two two for a uh, line distance. Based on um, what you see in front of you, would you like to make a guess? And this is on the 70 millimeter. Yeah. 
point zero two two. That was Matt's dumb guess. I can't measure point zero two two. I can measure point zero two. So you can agree or go up or down, basically a millimeter, or you know a hundredth. I'm, it's going to be in the point zero two range for sure. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be smaller than point zero two. Okay, that's fair. It's a fair guess. Let's see what we can do here. Because the last one you did was a 110, right? Yep. This looks like a great spot right here. Uh, DJ wants to know if we're streaming on YouTube only or Twitch as well. Currently, we're just on, on YouTube, but we do stream to Twitch now and again. Dude, that was a solid guess. It's like 0 0.025. It's definitely not touching that third line. I think a lot of that could actually be splash damage, too. Yeah. Like, if you went with a lighter mark, the line would be thinner, probably. Well, I'm not counting, like, that super, like dim like gray line above and below the silver i'm just counting the silver i'm gonna call that like 0 0.025 point zero two five. Point zero one two and a half yeah dude that's nuts that's a really small that's like a that's over a thousand dpi i think Rob from Wayne like Widgets that. said uh, he wouldn't turn his K40 on when he got it until he uh, checked all of the wiring. That's fair. That's very fair. I don't blame you. When I get machines in, I don't check uh, the wiring outside of maybe checking that the power supplies are set to 110 instead of 220. Uh, but that's mostly for like out of the box testing experience rather than validating things are proper because I need to test things as if people were pulling them out of box the box and using them uh, following the instructions kind of thing um, I have to look at it like that rather than an experienced user because not everybody is experienced um, so I, I I have to I have fire extinguishers if need be that might be the smallest dot size that I put on this sheet I'd be I'd be shocked if anything outclassed yeah. this, dude. I mean, That's, Matt was pretty damn close. It's just over two. It's definitely not three. What are you putting? Two and a half? Yeah, just put point oh two five. Yeah. Crazy. Which is ironic because that's the interval that we usually use on the fiber laser that definitely doesn't have this dot size. So the fiber laser is absolutely overlapping when we're doing vectors at point zero two five. But this can actually do point zero two five without overlap. It's pretty cool. Yester says, thanks again for the answers. Glad could meet you. Uh, meet great resource. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Meet you night and good luck with the build. Uh, thanks for stopping by. Yeah, thank Subscribe you. Subscribe and drop by again. Good having you. Cubing says 1,263 DPI. Damn, dude. That lines up. Sure does. So I guess I can just copy these red dot adjustment values and paste them for the entire UV. Uh, I mean, yeah, because you're using the source as your dot, so. Yeah, nice. Uh, jump and delay we'll do later. No first pulse killer on this. Uh, I'm missing some source information. I'll fill that out later. We have two serials. Material, wavelength are selected. Focal distance is measured. Spot size measured. Warp and corrections done. So there we go. So there's a second lens for the UV finished. And now we do it all over again. Mario so let's says, see what's next up. Mario Oops. says, I appreciate all your videos on the channel. It's a great resource. Just wanted to say that while I'm here. You guys hey, are awesome. Thank you. Thanks for, for hanging out and being part of the community. We appreciate you stopping by and uh, hanging out and asking questions. Sharing your experience as well. 
Uh, Jack says a study was done on Ford trucks. 80% of them made after 1990 are still on the road. 20% actually made it home. Oof. <laughs> Oof. It's coming from Jack, not me. <laughs> I miss the little like Hondas and Nissans that were really popular in the 90s. What happened to that Toyota joke from like 2009? Uh, Camrys, they keep going even if you don't want them to. And that was the joke yeah. on, on the recall of when the, the carpet slid into like the underneath the accelerator pedal. Oh, and yeah. Caused it to get stuck. Unintended, unintended, power. Un, unintended power. Yeah. That was, that was brutal. That was the butt of a lot of little uh, meme jokes in the late 2000s. <laughs> It was like 2009 or 2010, something like that. 2008. It's been a while. Yes. It's been a while. But I mean, yeah. Every brand's got their their faults, right? Nothing's perfect. Two ten one fifty, two fifty four, two fifty four is one seventy five, right? Um, it's 220. That's definitely not next. Yeah, 175. Yeah, this is a 300, which we're definitely not doing next. So, I believe the 150 millimeter is the next up to bat here. I'm just getting the next lens prepped here, guys. I'll try to switch the camera to something that isn't the microscope so you can actually uh, enjoy it. Oh, oh, I just had it. There we go. All right. So next up is our 150. We're just going to do it all again. Just going to keep going. Do it all again. That's my workhorse, man. I use that thing for everything. The 150 on the UV? Yeah. Yeah, the 150. You have I'm a 10 watt? Uh, no, I have a 5. Oh, you have a five and it works yeah. really? Does oh, yeah. well for you? Nice, nice, nice. That's good. That makes me, people have been making me feel bad about my five watts. When I got this machine, dude, 10 watts were so prohibitively expensive that I was like, I, I told the manufacturer they wanted to give me a 10 watt. And I was like, nobody's going to buy that. So don't send it to me because I'm not no. going to be able to share anything useful about it because by the time people think it's really cool and they want one, they're going to see the you know ten thousand dollar bill and they're not going to want it, and that the price has come down so far now. Like everybody's getting these ten watt machines, and I have five watts because I told them no. <laughs> Prices have come down. I mean, even even the sixty watt right sixty watt prices have yeah. come down. Uh, when I got my first sixty, well, my first laser was a sixty watt fiber, but. Or my first fiber, I should say, was a sixty watt. Um, it was like eight grand plus shipping. Yeah. Um, you can, you can get them now for. I mean, the same configuration you could probably get for like fifty nine to sixty nine. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe maybe less if there's like a sale from like a reputable brand that people know the name of right i saw a 50 watt fiber on facebook marketplace today for sale for like 2800 bucks like <laughs> to use like, hey. somebody yeah, wants it's, it's out of the business or they are hmm. having problems with their fiber um they said they got a new one because this one was marking darker in some areas than others. And I was like, something like maybe they're marking know. darker in some areas than others. Yeah. I was it like, that sounds, sounds like, like their Galvo arm isn't level to their bed. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that was my first thought. I was like, man, they're going to give up a 50 watt for something that big cheap. Like they hung their jacket on their Galvo head overnight and it just drooped a little bit. <laughs> Are you going to scoop it up? I don't know, dude. I'm kicking it around. I could use another fiber and a 50 watt. I might mess with always using another fiber. For sure. My wife might disagree, but. 
Hey, she's not here. Right, I was gonna say she doesn't visit the ladies very often. So. Uh, Cuban says also, why do we use that hatch with the fiber if it goes over itself? Um, depending on the mark you're looking for, you want there to be over ablation because it helps dig away material. Uh, yeah, basically the repeated, the repeated strikes in the same area get the material hotter than if you start an engraving at point A engrave all the way to point B and now point A has cooled down and then you come back and you start at point A again and you're hitting it again cold. When you tighten up your line distance like that and you're striking the same areas multiple times, it really does help with ablation. It's perfectly fine to do with uh, vectors because the whole area is going to be filled anyway. So it doesn't really matter. It's not something I would ever do on a photo. Right, because obviously every single independent line holds data about that photo, so you can't be overlapping them. Um, so there are times where that's okay, and there are times where that's certainly not okay. Um, that's one of the big reasons. The other big reason that me and everybody who ever learned how to do anything by watching my content uses 0 0.025 is because that is what Michael and I found works really well when we uh, started Sonoma laser engraving. We kind of picked a number small enough where we didn't have gaps in, in the, uh, in the images anymore and small enough that it was actually ablating the material, especially on reflective materials like brass, um, or silver really required a high DPI in order to ablate. And we kind of just ran with it because it worked so well. We ended up using it for just about everything. Again, the only time that that doesn't really work in your favor is when you're doing something like photos where you need every single line to stand independently of the next. Um, so yeah, there's there's a little bit of history about that number. Um, it also lines up super well with your steps per rotation when you're doing rotaries. Uh, 0 0.025 ends up being like a step on a rotary when you're going around a tumbler. So the math kind of works out nicely on that. Uh, but there's that was a coincidence, not an intentional, you know, by design. So um, really, it was an arbitrary number that we picked that works super good for everybody. And the rest is history. So that's kind of the, the short version, short answer to that question. But you could do that with anything. I mean, that would work great on the UV. If you're trying to ablate something with the UV and you're just not putting enough power downrange, try tightening your line distance to get overlap. Instead of doing 0 0.025, uh, try 0 0.0125, right? That would be half. So you'd be striking each line twice without letting that line cool down. Uh, and you, you may see better ablation, whether you're trying to do glass or wood or whatever it is. Um, so tightening up that line distance has a use outside of just, you know, making sure that all of the space on the substrate has been marked. You can actually use that as a heat tool to apply more heat to an area that you're struggling to ablate or engrave as well. So it's yeah. not limited to just fiber. It's a good uh, question though. It's a really smart question to ask. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kelsey says, this is really helpful to see your process of testing this out. Uh, it's why we, why we want to share. We want to hang out and answer questions and we got to go through the process anyway. Might as well share it. The reason that I'm not going painstakingly step by step through the configuration process is because not only do we have like multiple videos on this topic where, where we do this in like a non live format. So there's a lot less distractions, but also when this kind of live series, I guess, started uh, about a week ago, we did go step by step and kind of handheld through the entire process while we were setting up one of the lenses on the CO2 Galvo. And for all intents and purposes, the instructions are the same. So if you do like this format and you want to see every single little step that I'm doing, and I'm trying to talk about them here and there as we're working through the different lenses. Uh, but if you want every step really broken down, that was a great stream where we were setting up the CO2 Galvo lens. And then, like I said, we have videos that kind of direct you uh, on how to complete all of these steps individually, particularly on the Lightburn for Galvo crash course, uh, 
uh, if you watch that playlist on our channel, every single one of these steps is broken down into its own video. So you may find that useful as well. Yep. Um, I'm going to address this one as well. Mario says, others may disagree with what I'm about to say right now, but brands really don't mean much in the electronics. As someone with an electronics background that DIYs most of everything. 90% of those components are exactly the same. Once you take the case off, certain electronics, sure, but stuff like lasers, 3D printers, et cetera, it's not going to make a difference. We disagree. Some of that is accurate. Uh, yes, a lot of the components within the laser are off-the-shelf parts that you can buy. That's not what we're referring to at all. What we're referring to is the care that's taken with setting them up. So someone with an electronics background can, I'm sure, understand that there's uh, varying levels of quality on soldering and uh, wire joints and the care taken with labeling, labeling and organizing wires and protecting and shielding them from moving parts, uh, from being pinched, um, just as an example, right? Uh, there is care and quality in assembling a machine. Now, with somebody with an electronics background, maybe that care of quality and testing may not matter because you have the knowledge and know-how to go into the machine and dig through it and fix it. Um, it's not most of our audience. That's, that's not most of the general population. Most people don't want to spend several thousand dollars on a thing that they immediately have to rip apart and fix. So that's we we have to look at it as a general use case. We can't look at it as electronics professionals because realistically, me and Alex are not electronics professionals. We know lasers, but we're not professionals at soldering. Um, we can get around wiring if we have to, and we do. Um, but it's more again, about like to to the his point, quality. like. I Oh, go ahead. I, I feel like, you know, to a point, yes, like, you know, a resistor is a resistor and copper wire is copper wire. But like a random generic brandless power supply and a mean well are different things, you know, and we've seen it. We've seen that in our position as, you know, support specialists in this industry. I think there are differences between component brands. Uh, I, you know, I could, I could give a shit about the OEM. I don't really care who's putting it together as long as they're doing a good job, but the components inside the machine definitely matter. Uh, you know, if you tear those components down, are they all made out of the same things? I, you know, sure. Yeah. But like, like I said, you know, if you, if you have like just some generic, no name power supply in your machine, that rate of failure is way higher than when you get like a name brand power supply in there. And you, you know, you're and you're powering your components with it. So, and you know, I think I think there's a, some truth to both sides of that argument for sure. Yeah, and the the flip to that too is, does the warranty mean anything to you? Do you care if the the company's there in six months to a year if something fails, or are you just going to rip it out and order a replacement because it's not worth the hassle to you? Um, is their testing ahead of time and configuration worth anything to you? Um, I, I know at least, for example, three brands that, that we've reviewed on the channel or are in the process of reviewing, they run the lasers for an extended test period of typically 20 to 48 hours yeah. or even over a weekend just to validate that nothing's going to go wrong. Because typically when something goes wrong in electronics, it usually goes wrong within the 48, 48 hours of usage. Not within two days of it having it plugged in, but 48 hours of usage. So they get that out of the way by testing it, and they're looking for failure points. Most brands that are going for the cheapest possible price don't do that. They also don't do a lens configuration for you or a machine config for EasyCAD. They send you a generic copy of EasyCAD that'll get you running, and you're well, off to fine-tuning it yourself. And for Mario some people, is telling happens. you in chat to read on to his continued comments because he's refining his point. So, sorry, I had to step away for a sec. What was that? Oh, I said Mario's telling you that to read on further into his comments because he's refined his point. 
Oh, those weren't there when we started talking about this. Well, I know, I know. That's what I'm saying. Uh, it's something with microcontroller and Wi-Fi. Ninety percent of the time, it's an ESP32 running it. Bluetooth ESP32. If it's not Ethernet plug, almost bet the farm on it being an Arduino controller. Yeah, I mean that's fair. The assembly quality may be different, but the meat and potatoes are usually identical between brands because there's usually a limited amount of manufacturers producing those products. Absolutely. The the big components are are absolutely the same. A JPT yeah. laser source with a specific yeah. model number is going to be the same as well as a, as same as it can be from others. But yeah, we're we're talking about the everything else other than just the raw components. I mean, even with the power supply example, the people that are building the meanwhile power supplies out of the same components the generic is building the power supplies out of give more of a shit because they're getting paid better to sit there and do it. You know, like they, they care more about they the have higher quality of their product. They have higher standards. The managers it, at the production facilities give a shit whether their QA is on point. You know, so I think that's where those things kind of start to change, even though they're being built out of identical, you know, again, resistors and transformers, et cetera. Or even similar, maybe not even identical. Yeah. But, uh, you are missing what I said. Maybe you haven't read that far yet. There's a little that's bit of a delay between what you type and when we see it and discuss it on chat channel. So that's that's when I saw that. That's when I mentioned it to you. Dude. There's a little bit of a delay. You yeah. gotta give us a minute. Take care, Rob. Drive safe. I think a 45. So I know you were saying like do one at zero degrees and then do one at like some arbitrary angle. But I found the 45 degree crosshatch for finding focus has worked fine. I've just been doing that because I'm lazy. Makes sense. For the strip, you know what I'm talking about? Yep, 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 yep. Change your, uh, your camera angle. People love seeing that. Yeah, for sure. After you get it aligned anyway. Just using the paper here so I can see about where it's going to land on the card. Yep. No, we we got you, Mario. We get it. We're I think we're on the same page now. We're not disagreeing that the components are aren't at least remotely the same. It's just the other stuff is often what matters more to people. At least in a as a as a consumer um, product, whether they know it or not. Yeah. Yep. And in the off chance that they do have to open the thing up and be their own warranty support, they want it to be organized and labeled. They don't want a rat's nest of cables, which is, again, something we have to look at. So it does Oof. does matter. Missed that big time. Oof. Way higher. I'm uh, I'm gonna have to step away for a minute and see what in the hell is going on in my house. I will be right back. Okay. Good luck. What machine is that, Anthony? That is the slide. <clears throat> Are you on like a weird mic or something? You're super quiet today. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I've got headphones in because I don't have a mic here. So I oh, we to get better headphones. All good. So what? Yeah, that's what the uh, the flying bear. Oh, the or flying. The, oh, is that one of the ones that they sent over to you? Yeah, you yep. sent that over. Kyle, right? Kyle did. Yeah. What do you think of it? I think it's. Uh, it's a very neat and kind of quirky machine. Um, but I mean, it has like a, has a digital control pad on it. So in an SD card slot, so you can run jobs independent without a computer. Um, nice. It has a, you can kind of see in the back, there's a black box with a white hose leading into it. It came with a, yeah. like 120 millimeter fan for exhausting and like some paper filters, which yeah. works pretty decent, except for the fact that if you're using it with light burn, um, 
the fan doesn't run at all. You have to use the fan only through the onboard controller. Uh, yeah, I was kind of hoping that like one of the air assist switches and light burn or something would activate it, but it didn't. So, right. Um, so what I did is I just removed the fan and the filter and I run my exhaust into that box because there's a 3D printed nozzle on the back of the laser head that attaches yep. to that hose that goes to the fan. So it instead of like an air assist blowing, it's like a bit of fresh air assist. So it pulls all the smoke out and just exhausts it right out. So I found that really handy. Yeah, it's got kind of like old Adam Stack vibes to it. It's got like that that uh I'm fucking blanking on the name right now, so I'm having a stroke. But like the rod that goes across driving like the, the other butter. And yeah, and stuff yeah, yeah, like yeah. Mm -hmm. It's pretty neat. Yeah, it's it's been a good machine. It's a five watt, so it's you know not like overpowering, but it's it's adequate. You're gonna re you're gonna review that bad boy for us? Yeah, I've been uh, recording a bunch of footage and stuff, you know, on days that I don't have a bunch of other stuff. So nice. I did some glass with it, um, done a bunch of wood, did a mirror. Really starting to get some of that, uh, a little play in the focal distance now at 150 it's not quite so narrow yeah Again, yeah trying to do rotary to... i'm sorry oh, go ahead. ahead no you go i was ahead. just saying trying to do rotary work with the 70 on like glass and stuff is kind of prohibitive because of the you know you get little ripples in the glass that's why I just made yeah. the 150. It's, it is a little bit more. Ugh, those are not straight, but I think I like the one on the right better. All right, let's take a focal distance measurement here. So are you going to be? Nope, not even close. All right. Getting the big boy out. Hardest part about this is keeping the, making sure the stick is like parallel to the engraving path, making sure it's straight up and down. Two fifty six, two fifty seven, dude. I love this thing so much. <laughs> This focal distance finder. That's pretty so cool. nice. Yeah. yeah. Rob did a really good job on them. 257. All right. Let's get that added to our sheet. If you guys are uh, leaving questions in chat, again, just feel free to leave them. Uh, when Kyle gets back, he will catch us up on chat. For sure. We got 257, and let's give this stick a serial. DFS 210, 150. All right, awesome. So with that done, I'm just going to head over again to the mirror real quick, guys, and uh, we're going to get a focal stick cut here. Yeah, my 150, I think, is 273. Nice. Yeah, well, that's why I always tell people, like, it, it matters what machine you're on, you know, even yep. like two identical lenses that are on two different machines and there are no identical lenses, but even if there were two identical lenses on two different machines, you're going to have a different focal length. Yep. It was a very disappointing thing to learn for early Alex.
Yeah, that's why I brought it up, just so people can realize, like, there's, even if they were the same brand, whatever, there's still that, that range. Because I get people requesting, like, core files all the time. They're like, hey, can you shoot yours? For your I'm like, it's not going to be Yeah, like, sorry, bro, it doesn't work that way. Two ten one fifty, and then it's two fifty seven. Just double check those values. Two ten one fifty two fifty seven. Two ten one fifty two fifty seven. So that should be perfect. One last look here at our sticks. Total length is two fifty eight. Again, to uh, kind of offset that curve there, we should be able to send this over to the mirror and get it run real quick. I think I've got a sheet of acrylic at home. I could use bush pregnant and fold it. I use a, a ruler and lines on my laser head all the time. Ooh. Focus sticks definitely make it easier. Yeah, dude, I cut sticks for everything. I cut them for my gantries, I cut them for my diodes, I cut them for my, uh, my galvos, just across the board. I'm back. Hey, what a mess. I'm just cutting the focal stick for the 150 millimeter lens. Sorry, I had to step away there. Fucking so good. family stuff. All good. Alrighty. I'm getting set up to do to reattempt my timing and delay test. Or rather my delay, not my timing. Or not even my jump settings, my delay. Yeah. You should do a little mini Kyle lesson on that because that's something through all of these config videos we haven't really talked about yet. I need to make sure my the the stuff I fine tuned last night is actually allowing me to proceed with that. This script this is dead for long sticks anyway.
with the nice weather came my uh, my allergies, of course. Yeah. Sneezing all over the place. Be right back. I'm going to have to build another work table for the laser room so I can put the Muji on it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, dude. There's always a shortage of tables around here. <laughs> oh, this wood smells so good. There's walnut. Oh, nice. Yeah. You make this some fancy focal space. Yeah, that's right. Well, it just came out of that Ukuch, the seconds box. Oh, yeah. So it's like just all that crappy scrap wood. The whole box of it was like 25 bucks. Oh, no, it didn't cut all the way through. Shit. waste this wood and try to finish it off with a razor. Got to do surgery on the need you to put the new control board in. Oh boy. The other one got smushed to death. That's brave, dude. I don't like at least all these Galva machines are kind of like more or less the same. But when you're getting into the diodes, I really feel like they just like invent brand new systems every time that they start <laughs> putting controllers into them. So how you feel about it after, because you definitely have more diode experience than I do, or do you feel like they're actually pretty similar? No, I think that the degree of similarity is radically different with the diodes. Like there's, each manufacturer has their own proprietary stuff that interacts differently. One of the things, one of the few things that I just like about the new G is the, uh, the fact that they put the limit switch on the main board. So Wait, when that hold on, hold on, switch... hold on. Are you? You said you're on headphones. Yeah. Are they? Are you sure they're connected to your phone? Positive. Yeah. That's so weird. It just sounds like like I'm in your chest pocket or something. <laughs> I think it was because I was bent over. It's like the beats that go over your neck. So oh, the there you go. Yeah, that's over. nice. All right, now I can hear you. My bad. So, so what were you saying about the similarity between them? Oh, I think each each different company just they're all radically different. There's no oh yeah know, great at all. <clears throat> and then the Niji they put they put the limit switch for the Y axis on the control board. Mm -hmm. So when it smashed the limit switch, it effectively just moved the whole board. So I just bang. Oh. It was like 85 bucks on the new board instead of a couple bucks for a new switch. Yeah. So that was kind of annoying. I didn't even hear about what like actually happened. What actually happened? Um, it just smashed well, it one day. It was like, hey, <laughs> fuck no, you. like like what happened with Kyle. Um, all of my profiles went away magically. Oh one day. no. Yeah. And. When I was trying to set everything back up, uh, the Niji has a different origin than a lot of the other lasers. So the origin just defaulted wrong. Right. And the machine tried to home and it homed fine. But then when I tried to do any kind of movement, 
that was trying to go up instead of down. Mm -hmm. And it just smashed that lemon switch. Damn. It's kind of chintzy to start off with. Do they use the like the like electromagnetic limit switches or do they have physical switches? It's a physical switch. Yeah. So you can see this is one limit switch here. I can't remember if this is X or Y, but it's built onto the side. This one is built on the side. Right. Yeah, not the greatest design. Hey, look, it's Kyle. It's been a day, apparently. Apparently. I was able to rescue the 150 millimeter stick with the uh, with the razor, so that was nice. nice. And now I'm just gonna run another lens correction. Dude, this rolling cart was a great idea. It's so nice to just push the computer back and forth. Also, apparently, got a Nisian four replacement. Of the stuff, Nisian three. This is reason number 253 to back up your profiles, kids. Oof. Huh, Kyle? <laughs> huh? Oh, the, I'm repairing the damage done to my Niji 3S, or 3 Max, rather, um, <clears throat> from when the uh, my profiles got deleted. The... Uh, Origin was set wrong, so it smashed the limit switch in this ignition. The limit switches are built into the control. So. Yeah. 
That's always fun. Hey, Alex. Let's see. Hey, yes. Uh, when you do your your delay values, like your uh, delay time, and then your min and max uh, based on distance. What do you usually yeah. do to test that? Do you do like bidirectional fill, fill shapes individually or what? I would be doing, yeah. So I would do uh, not not a bidirectional fill. You have to do unidirectional fill because bidirectional fill will like obfuscate your results. So it's going to be a unidirectional fill with a contour sub layer. And then what you're looking for is for the start delay, like where the, the pulse starts, whether or not it's connecting to the contour. And then on the contour itself, you're looking at the corner where it starts and stops drawing the square. And you wanna make sure that that corner is connected at both the start and the end point, which should both land right on the corner of the square. So- Well, I'm on, I'm on the text test, not the square one. Oh, oh, for jump delay. Yeah. Um, I just do, I just do text and I just do it with a crappy resolution essentially. So that you're able to see the, uh, the individual lines, you know, so I so I've like a 0.05 or whatever. Maybe even bigger. Yeah. Um, you'd have to reference the actual video for the real settings, but you know, it's it, there's certainly a visible grid at that point during the test. It might even be like point two, point one, or point two. All right, I'll give this a try. Sorry, I'm sure that wasn't the answer you wanted. It is quite all right. I'm gonna throw my headphones on so I'll be able to hear you guys better. Hopefully you'll be able to hear me better while I'm moving around. These test grids are getting big. Back on the measurement train.
and you're still kind of muffled and broken up or something, dude. So is Kyle trying to talk right now? Yeah, I can kind of hear like a faint, like faint voice from God. That's crazy. Can't hear shit, bro. Are you trying to talk to me too, Anthony? Yeah, could you not hear me? No, dude, I can't hear oh. you either. It, it's <laughs> the last crap. like five minutes of this stream have been like a weird, muffled, quiet, scary movie. <laughs> I was like saying I wish I had more. I was saying I wish I had more cameras so I could like show myself oh, working yeah. on this diode instead of just my diode run here. back it off that's probably more interesting show that i want to see that yeah just my camera set up for the gym. yeah well yeah. i'll see if i can maybe try so was something. mine for a long time even now it's not great people are staring at the back of my head while i take measurements of a taped up piece of acrylic <laughs> can you hear me now yes, yes. There he is. I'm going to stop my camera for a second. So just doesn't want to friggin' cooperate. Oh, that's way better right there. Whatever you well, I'm, I'm on the HyperX now, so. Oh. Uh, you got the cloud, cloud two. Me though, right? Yep, that kind of is going back out again. It was really good for a second. I was kind of iffy. Maybe it's just trying too hard to sound cancel the fans and stuff. I don't know. And now you sound great. Yeah. Well, don't don't move. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta move. I gotta go do laser stuff. Do we need to get you some like metal bunny ears? Am I going to be part of the reception? No, he, like for two years. <laughs> no, I think what I I'm I'm probably going to invest in a lav mic here in a little bit. I think. Mm. <laughs> he wasn't talking about like the kitty cat headphone ears. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> Yeah, having the lab is nice for sure. All right. We're going to see if my little test is going to behave now. Well, I just finished the light burn lens corrections, and now I'm going to start my scale test. Oh my God, Kyle, is that you, dude? I think, yeah, that's the same thing it was doing like Friday, isn't it? Kyle, you're getting like cellular interference. Yeah, I just muted better? myself. Oh, there you go. Yep. Yeah. It was definitely me. It, it's because it switched devices. To, for some reason, it thinks my, micro, my uh, microscope has a mic on it. So it's just uh, giving you guys digital feedback, which, uh, you know, it's, it's exciting. I mean, it was a sick beat for sure. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I, I bet it was. Let's see. How'd we do? Close. I can see a little, a couple hairs on that zero. So 
So I did these lines here. Let me zoom out a little more. So I did these lines intentionally 11 millimeters apart mm -hmm. to test min and max on that value. And then a yeah. couple tight lines for the min. Nice. Yep. I didn't. That's just 7,000 with zero and zero. So I think I probably need to go with a, a slightly higher line distance. It's kind of yep. washing it out. Yeah, definitely. The same, like 0 0.1, 0 0.2. All right, let's go back to uh, over here. <sighs> wow, this light burn bug is pissing me off. What light burn bug? The one with the black layer not going away once I've removed all of the black crap from the workspace. Uh, I think the last time I had that, I, I opened up, I double clicked the layer mm -hmm. and then reset it to default. Yeah. And then created a black thing and deleted it and it went away. I didn't do it. No, I did the thing again where I left it on the mirror settings for cutting the focal stick, but I'm on the UV. So when I went to go do the scale test, it just is like eating the acrylic board. Whoops. Yeah, whoops. We don't want 20 millimeters a second. We want 300. Yeah, you see how clean those uh, end lines are, and then these leading lines to the left are uh, are frayed. Mm -hmm. Lately, dude, I've just been going with like the default max value. I don't think that the like honing the jump delay settings in super duper well. No, oh, I just want a clean result. That's all. Yeah, it makes enough of a difference. Well, even going to just that one change, I'm no longer getting crap in the middle of my zeros, so. That's nice. Yep. And for the giggles, I'm gonna change it to Change it to let's try 200. It's been a long time since I've tuned in these jump delays, so I'm by far the rustiest at this at this point. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I don't even know if it's really like worth the effort when I can just set them to like, you know, uh, set the jump speed to like 2000 and then the min and max jump delay to 500 microseconds and they call it a day. Cause it's way overkill and yes, it's slower, but like how much slower and is it worth it to like try to get it as fast as possible? Maybe for some people, but we're talking about the difference of like seconds on jobs sometimes. So, I don't know. I guess it depends on who you are and how much free time you have. I don't know. How would you rate this? Uh, hold on. I'm going to have to step closer to the computer.
I mean, it, it looks pretty good. I might even do like, I might do like bigger text to soften the uh, scan lines out. So we're only looking at the jump points and not at the individual scan lines. I think that might make it a little clearer to see. Thirty by one thirty. All right. And we'll record into these results. There's the text. Yeah, let's take a look at that. That looks really clean. I don't see any jump lines. Just for but size yeah. context, that was the height of the text before. Yeah. So I've doubled it. Yeah, I mean, the key with jump, right, is like, where are we moving from that A to the W? And where is the W starting? And can you tell? Because if you can't tell, I mean, your jump is good, you know? It certainly doesn't look like line to line on an individual letter. Those are absolutely fine. If you don't see any defects between the letters when it's jumping from one letter to the other, then you're golden, man. I mean, those look, that looks really clean. It should be scanning from left to right and then top to bottom. Yeah. I could, I guess, increase the, the hatch size again, but. Yeah, I don't see anything. Any kind of like artifacting we're seeing there is just the product of the, um, the interval. Yeah. And the size of the text. I don't think. I don't think there's any kind of symptoms of a, a jump delay issue. In the text that I'm looking at right now. Cool. I am recording the values for the 150. Just about done. The only thing that I have to do after this is the spot size test. I am recording my jump delays. I'm not going to I'm not going to fine tune a minimum cuz I just yeah, I, didn't I don't care that much. I, I was able to get away with 7000 speed. I'm not I'm not going to save much time dropping them in. So I don't really care. Yeah. All right. I'm done with my 200. So I'm actually going to move down to my 110 now. <sighs> so Anthony, what are we looking at? Your uh, your limit switch replacement, your board replacement, or what are you working on? Yeah, well, you're looking at my yeah. wall right now. Well, yeah, I know, but I see wires and shit. Yeah, it's 
I'm over here trying to put this back together now. So it's kind of hard to get this gantry put together without a big table to put it on. So. Yeah, I bet. About to get the spot size for the 150 on UV, which is the most fun part, I think. Oh, that's what I didn't do. I didn't validate the spot size. Mm -hmm. uh, I should probably well, do that that's, before I switch lenses. Yeah, I mean, that's easy enough to go back and do, other than actually physically swapping the lens. It's not that bad. Guys, don't get excited at this. This is still the 70, but let's get the 150 under there. Take a look. I have, I have those rulers you sent me the kit of. Oh, yeah, dude. Let it's me. So nice. The ones in the yellow box? Yeah, I haven't actually tried them yet. We're going to give it a go. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, they're my favorite. Obviously, the stereo microscope helps because... Yeah, we're going to see how effective it is on a crappy microscope. Yeah. There we go. Let's see. Do, 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 do. It's all bright. Point one, two, three. This one's like point three and a half, which makes sense. It's kind of scaling up in a linear way. Point oh three five, not bad. Yeah, so I've got 0 0.025, 0 0.030, 0 0.035, which that tracks. And the, I was expecting uh, a little bit bigger. Down. That's not bad. What, on the dot size? Yeah, for the 150. Yeah, dude, an uh, extra... Five thousandths of a milli millimeter. I'm fine with that. Two, uh, what do we go? Two fifty four, one seventy five. Yeah, that's uh. Let's see. So, point 
0.035. That's still 700 DPI, 725. The 70s at 1,000 and the 110s at 850. So we went from 850 DPI to 725. I mean, it's a drop, but it's not it's not substantial, especially when you're like, you know, practical use cases. I mean, anything over 600 for a photo is, is bonus. It's like bonus detail, man. Yeah. No one's ever going to see anything past 600. Oh, my God, dude. I'm feeling your pain on getting this lined up. Yeah, I know. You, like, breathe on it wrong, and it, like, flies, like, 10 miles away. That's about as in focus as I can get, and as close as I can get. It's hard to read, for sure. Um, you could try flipping it over. Uh, the lines are printed on one side of that glass. So if you get the lines so that the side they're printed on is touching the metal card, then they are much easier to focus at the same time. Whereas uh, if they're on top of the glass, you can only really focus to one or the other. That would be my one pro tip. Oh my God, stop moving. I apologize if I'm giving anybody motion sickness. I'm giving myself motion sickness. All right. I should check chat while I'm over here. Groundhog lied, rough. I really need to be going through this too. I never fine tuned my laser jack. Come on, bro. You gotta, you gotta do this. This is well needed. It's time. Join, join the boys. You can do it together with us. I mean, you're basically measuring like tenths of a millimeter there. You can't really separate out the individual hundredths lines. I guess, like, you could do half steps. It would probably help if I was doing this on a blue card instead, but I don't If you're, have like, right there, dude, it looks like you're at, like, just under a mil. Maybe, like, 0.08. That seems really big for a fiber on a 200 lens. Doesn't it? it? I don't know. 0.08. Where would that be on... Oh, I know my DPI is better than um, my intervals. I'm doing it. 0.08. Oh, I guess not. 317 lines per inch. Eh, that's about on point for where you should be. Yeah, that's a guess, right. obviously. I'm guessing because you're, you know, we can't I mean, really tell. I, I don't have the fidelity you have with... Uh, label it. Label it and throw it in the mail, dude. I'll double check it. You can do a bunch of them. Just keep them all labeled and throw them in the mail. And I'll look at them under the scope and I'll give you real numbers for them. But 0.08 ish is good for now. You can put like a little symbol next to it or something so everybody knows it's temporary. Um, oh, right. We're changing our lens. So we're all done with the 150. Woo! That's three UV lenses done today. And I think we have time for one more before I have to leave. So that will be very nice. We'll have. Four out of six done, which is excellent. So we've got, let's see, we did our 70, we did our 110, and we did our 150. So we're going to move on to the 175. We'll finish that one today, and then next time I have to do the 220 and the 300. I'm interested. You haven't messed with a 300 on your UV, have you, Anthony? Oh, I don't have a 300. 
You don't have the 300 for the UV? I don't I even do. know what it's going to do. It might not do anything. But I'm really curious. Yeah. <clears throat> it may just sit there and do nothing. I kind of figured that's what was going to happen. <laughs> so on, I just didn't. On glass, it will absolutely have a very hard time. Yeah, but like wood, I mean, like the my lenses, my smaller lenses chew through wood like nothing is there. So I might be able to mark with like a nice dot size on wood at 300. Like and doing photos on wood would be really cool. Yeah, that would be like a huge benefit over something like the CO2 Galvo, where you're starting with a fat dot, you know, on like yeah. the smaller lenses. So there may be there may be like a value there. Or, you know, the 300 is reserved for people with higher wattage lasers. And that's fine, too. But I wanted to get one either way just to make sure um, that wasn't crazy. Uh, I'm going to set up the device profile now on the PC so you guys can hang out for that. Uh, and then once we get that device profile set up, we will do our focal point test. And then we'll see how much time we have left. We're doing good on time, though. We're whipping through these. Unlike previous live streams we've done this week where we run into some kind of issue and have to stop and fix the issue, uh, today we're actually getting some of these done. And that feels good. Miranda said, you're still live? Yes. Yep. You know it. Kyle, we're swapped again. Is it convenient for you to swap us back? I can do it. I got it. There we go. All right, cool. Um, Mario said, some guy behind the curtain, what's your channel again so I can make sure I'm subbed? Uh, here, laser everything. Uh, it's I'm, Kyle. I'm, I'm Kyle. I'm just, uh, Yeah. I'm just I'm labeled Kyle, some I'm guy Kyle. behind the curtain because I'm just behind the scenes usually. During Kyle's a troll. He's trolling. Give you something to troll. Ooh, got him. Uh, no, I'm I'm normally just uh, I'm behind the scenes a lot of the time with the uh, the live streams depending on what's going on. But today I'm joining in on the fun, um, and I'm also on the podcast and I do episodes so. You can see all of the content I make right here. Oh, wait. I was doing something in Lightburn. There we go. Do, 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 do. I was working on making a box so you could measure four. Uh, going to bother my OCD. Jack said, uh, Jack said, uh, Alex is getting in trouble when Miranda showed up. Uh, whether I'm not, whether I'm getting in trouble or not entirely depends on how many viewers we have on the stream at any given time and how many people have liked it. Oh, John from Matron is trying to get in touch with me. Uh, I'll reach out to you, John, if you're watching still. He's in Orlando. We should have them up at the shop. Ooh, that would be cool. Yeah. Uh, Mike C said, what happened with the last live? Tried to go back and watch it, but no go. Uh, no, nothing. It should be good. I don't know. Let me check. Let's see. Ooh, that oh, I screwed up already. Uh, let's see. We go live. Emergency UV laser surgery. It's there for me, dude. Should be there for you, too. 
Uh, I can check this in an incognito just to make sure it's not because I'm logged in. Yep, seems to also be there for incognito, ads included. Um, so this was the last live that we did. Let me make sure that nothing else is missing, just in case you're referring to something else. Uh, live UV laser surgery. Uh, before that, we did the EasyCAD downgrade. Before that, we did the CO2 Galvo lens corrections. And then it's podcast episodes pretty much all the way through. Um, so they should all be there. Those are the last four uh, kind of of this little adventure we've been on. Um, so you should be good. If you can see all four of those, then you'll have not missed anything. Okay, we've got a new lens we got to set up. Copy, not cut. Devices. I wish there was just a duplicate button here. So I didn't have to like export, edit, import. I really don't like doing that. It's actually a good idea. Yep. <clears throat> Serial number. 175, and we'll hit save. Import the dupe. And to 175. Open. Uh, we just have to rename this, edit. Overwrite. And we gotta change our dupe. One seventy-five by one seventy-five, and finish. Here we go. There's a fourth lens for the UV. There we go. Some nice clean lines for Alex to measure my line values. Yay! So that'll be my little. That? Huh? Is it labeled? Yep. I'm. I'm okay. gonna do them all in one card. Nice. And that way, it'll be nice and fast. Coolio. Yeah. Ooh, these workspaces are getting big. Look at that 175. 175 is probably your happy medium for trying to project mark with, huh? Because you're, asked, you're just... Asked, uh, Anthony. Anthony was telling me like 150 was pretty much the sweet spot for him on most things. I, well, I only have two lenses, so <clears throat> I need to add something to the staple, but the 150 is pretty forgiving. I'd imagine 175 would be two. My only worry is with glass, the power density going down too much. But it doesn't seem like that's much of an issue because going from a 70 millimeter to the 150 is what? 100? Yeah, uh, yeah, one. We've lost one hundredth of a millimeter in dot size between those two lenses, so it may not be as big of an issue on the UV. I mean, wouldn't that be nice? That would be something we have to test for sure. But I get where you're going with that. I mean, there are definitely power density changes. I can tell just because when I do these focal like ramp test essentially um i'm seeing like a good bit of change in the areas that are really marking the metal down so tbd all right so now that i have Now that I have this lens done, I'll go down here and I'm going to export this so that if anything happens to it, it's uh, it doesn't go bye bye. Yeah, and you're going to export it to Google Drive, right? Yep, I'm doing it right now. Yeah. Smart. Wise man. 
All right. This really needs one more piece of tape on it. I cannot find anything in my shop right now. That's so annoying. I know. Don't you hate that? Well, I, so I disappear from the channel for weeks at a time because I'm just like looking for a single caliper. I went to go pay my rent the other day and I finally got some business checks. In. I could not find my checkbook anywhere. Oh my God. That's because it's so 2024 I... and God doesn't want you to have a checkbook. <laughs> <laughs> So I literally ripped apart my entire office twice trying to find oh. a checkbook. And it was, like it was in my car. garage. Oh, it was, it was close. Garage. Yeah, very close. My uh, backpack had spilled over when I was working on my CO2. Uh. And my checkbook and my journal that I keep, like, my settings and stuff in. Yeah. Was sitting on the floor. And I was like, oh. Because I was, like, so emotional. I was like, this is my first time ever having a business account. First time having business checks. And I lost them before I could even write my first check. <laughs> no. That just, means, that just means you're a real entrepreneur. Welcome to the club. <laughs> I came home Friday night, like, on the verge of tears. I was like, I don't even, I can't do this thing. I can't run my own business. I can't even keep track of a checkbook. Bro. That's, no, you're literally do. describing to me why I got married right now. <laughs> See, my wife was there, and she's like, calm down. I mean, not the first one to ever lose a checkbook. I was like, yeah. Nah, dude, your wife was like, your wife was like, did you look in the garage? <laughs> so Miranda always tells me to look better. Just like look harder. See, that's usually me because she'll look for stuff but not move it. Mm. And I'm like, if you would have moved like two things, you would have found that. All right. So now I'm down to the point where I got to make. A focal test. Yep, I'm doing that too. It's peanut butter jelly time. Nugget heard that song for the first time the other day and she really likes it. <laughs> yeah. Like with the dancing banana and everything. Good. Man, I guess when you don't have the red dot, you can really use the sharpness of the framing line to kind of get a good guess of where your laser needs to be over the test card. Yeah, dude. Because it's the same laser, right? So if it, the framing laser looks like it's in focus around the middle of the card. That's where it should be in focus when you run the test. I love my UV, dude. All right, I gotta switch that one. Probably put these back on. <laughs> Miranda said, "Alex will look for something. Declare it's not there. Then I look to find it under a minute. <laughs> Did you even look, bro? <laughs> so one thing I really like about these Wisely lenses." is they have metal lens caps that screw on. Oh, very nice. Yeah, the only downside is if you ever screw them on oh, just a little too tight. But they're they're super nice. 
this guy was trying to help set up his UV. Um, he was trying to get his lens out so we could swap from uh, 70 to 150, I think is what he had to. Yeah. And he had like a pipe wrench on that lens trying to take it out, and it would not cool. come out. At that the, point, um, you have to wonder if like penetrating oil or some uh, something would just be a yeah. better option just to get yeah. it into the threads to start. Because you don't want to get that stuff in the mirrors, but if you can't right. get the lens off, you can't get the lens off. Yeah, well, I told him to, like, once we were done, just go get, like, a hair dryer and, like, heat up that adapter. Because he ended up unscrewing the adapter from the head. So I was yeah. like, just get a hair dryer or something or a heat gun and hit the adapter and just try and stay on the top half of the adapter so you're not heating up the lens at the same time. I don't yeah. know if we got it out or not. I'll message, message him. Yeah, that's brutal. Yeah. yeah. So I just wanted to show this to you guys again really quick um, while we're here looking at it. Uh, you can really see where it fades out here. And then it starts to come in. And this is where Kyle's idea of adding the crosshatch, this was not visible without that crosshatch. It just kind of looked like a sloppy mess. But as soon as you introduce that crosshatch, you can literally see it. it's like way out of focus and it starts to come in. And then we get that really nice sharp metal right in the middle. It gives us a really clear defined point of focus that we're marking off and measuring. And then that fade out and then the completely out of focus again. So it gives you a really, really nice symmetry and a really clean pattern where you can identify exactly the point we should be measuring right about here, uh, exactly the point that you're trying to measure to in order to get that nice, crisp focal point. So um, this is a really good demonstration of that. And as we go up in lens size, uh, you know, that's going to be harder and harder to see because our test area is going to continue to grow. Um, and so all of these areas out of focus, focusing in and completely in focus, they're all going to expand. And that's going to be more and more difficult to see. So I wanted to show you guys while we still had a lens where it's easy to spot uh, that that nice in focus point right there, because that's what I'm going to be marking off and measuring to here. Sorry, Anthony, I mean to cut you off. Apparently, Anthony's dead. So I don't need to feel guilty. <laughs> no, I'm here. Are my headphones oh, dead? Okay. No, I said, I, I, no, I, heard, oh. I can hear you now. I said, sorry, bro. I didn't mean to cut you off. And there was like silence. And I was like, all right, we're not friends anymore. That's fine. <laughs> this has been like the worst audio day. Yeah, dude. You're having a bad audio day for real. I, uh, this is like, I need to do what you did. I need to raise up my uh, my focal point. You raise me up. I'm using Anthony's tape to raise my focal point. Okay. Dude, I'm running out of Anthony's tape. I have very little of Anthony's tape left, and I'm upset about it. It's a problem. All right. Well, I got to go to the post office here in the next few days, anyhow, so I can drop some. I'll buy it, dude. You don't have to send it to me. Pish posh. I only want free stuff from giant companies that can afford it. Hit me with that conglomerate giveaway. You know what I mean? It's a uh, tax write-off for advertising. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, a review <laughs> unit. It's a nice mark. If you guys can see this, I'm still marking it off right in the middle. And it is shining a little different now because it is a bigger focal area than some of the other ones is. But now we have a nice clear point to measure to. I'm able to see this a lot better with the naked eye than you're able to see it on camera right now, uh, especially because the window is a little smaller. But that does look like about the middle of that area to me. And uh, so that's the point that I'm going to be focusing to. As we get lower 
and or well higher and higher i guess in our workspace uh it matters less and less because you're more and more likely to be in focus but if i am doing something that requires a larger depth of field that's when it's going to be important for this to be accurate not necessarily when we're working on flat surfaces so uh, you still want to try to get it as close to center as possible Looks like this is going to be about 311. Yeah, looks good. So back over here on the computer, I'm just going to open up my sheet. We're going to do the same thing. So we're going to go to 311 here. And then we just have to get our stick together. So you're at 253 on the 150. There's a there's a really good visual of uh, seeing a focal point go in and out. Oh, on your screen? Let me walk yeah. over and take a look. What laser is that on the fiber? It's the 60 watt JPT with uh, one time lens. Mm hmm. Yeah, that one's nice and clear, too. So the way I have my focal setup set up is I can literally just take... See, Jack in the shop said I needed to change a relay on my plasma table last week. Could not find my relays anywhere. As soon as I ordered two new ones on Amazon, I found the ones I had. <laughs> it's funny yeah, how that works, stuff. isn't it? Yeah. That's exactly how it goes. Dude, you need to unbox Rob's focal distance finder instead of using that crappy ruler. Um, finding the focal head off the bottom of my jig thing. Mm. Three eleven. Big but I will do that now, actually. Let's import. Let's stick large. Yes. Oh, yeah. All right. 311. And we need to take that up to 312 for curve. And width, we want about 100. I just need to serialize this bad boy. This stick is 311. To the mirror we go. Did 
give myself a little more room to unbox with. Those good sounds, Anthony. Is that a good sound in here? Uh, that was me. That was that was me. Oh, that was Kyle. <laughs> you do it. That was very mechanical. I was moving some stuff around so I have a little more focal height oh. to work with. Rob's in chat actually. He said, "Hey, just made it back and heard you were unboxing." Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. I'm even going to use my freshly engraved knife to cut this box open. Oh. If you guys didn't see it, uh, there's not a lot of light. Um, my workspace is chaos right now, but maybe I could do this. There we go. So I did like a stipple engrave on the knife. But... Rob, enclosed, find two adjustable focal sticks and an LEQ. Enjoy, Rob, aka We Do Widgets. Oh, he sent you a cube too? Uh, that's what it says. Bro, you're gonna love the cube, dude. Well, let's open this guy up. Here, I was thinking I was special. Rob's just giving those cubes out. So we got a little thumb screw. Lefty Lucy. Yeah, there we go. So this is for a range of 130 to looks like maybe 212, 214. And it was packaged up nicely in some bubble wrap with a piece of cardboard to hold it flat. And next up, we got... Oh, it's taped in place. It was holding this together. I'll have to look at that. I don't know what an LE cube is off the top of my head, so we're going to find out. And here is a big old focal stick. Look at that. It's nice, smooth. Right? It's yeah. really smooth. I know. Yeah, dude, I like that. Yeah, they're super easy to use, dude. I really, really like them. Yeah, Mario, the uh, the Mira 9 is pretty, and they did do a good job with it. Actually, it needs a little work right now. The gantry is not level with the bed, or I have a mirror alignment issue, which wouldn't be shocking because I've kicked the thing across a parking lot, essentially. So uh, it's, it definitely needs an adjustment. I shouldn't be having to make two passes to cut through this focal stick, but um, it is what it is. We'll, we'll get it fixed up. Uh, that's not their fault. That's my fault for just being so rough with it. I think it, this is the LE cube that was on the note. We're going to open this up. Ooh. Yeah, dude. I don't, I don't know if this is really doing this justice. It's not. 
I may have to go over to the big camera here. Pretty though, right? Green laser. Oh, I don't even want to touch it until uh, until I get the camera on it here. Hold on. I, I have mine sitting on my amplifier for my speakers right here on the other side of the studio. And crank the light up so it goes through it a little bit more. Oh, go. Cool. That's nice. And it's like subsurface as you, you know. And pull it out. Oh, that's why you said green laser. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. So it's subsurface. You can see the line of the engraving like a solid centimeter below. It's really difficult to portray these in real life. But maybe it's too much light. I think I might be overexposing it. That's better. That's pretty. And as you'd expect, you don't feel it because it's subsurface. Thank you for that, Rob. That's friggin' beautiful. Yeah, man. Super cool. They did that. They're really nice. I don't want to screw it up, so it's going to stay in the box for a little while until I have a home for it. That is the difference. He says, he says photographing them is always a challenge. Yeah, I would believe it. Yeah. Yeah, that's the difference between you and me, bro. I just like immediately put mine out, like just out in the wild. Yeah, I'm uh I like keeping things pretty. I'm I'm too OCD. All right. Let's see. Back to the laser view. Oh no. Oh, that didn't even happen on camera. And we have it in action. Alex breaking stuff. One of my sound panels just fell off the wall. Thank God it didn't take anything down with it. That sucks. What was it attached with? <clears throat> the double-sided adhesive it came with. I must have just not done a great job pressing it onto the wall. But it didn't take anything or off. Or maybe the, the double-sided adhesive just sucks. Ah, uh, maybe. I've some spray adhesive I'll hit it with before I put it back up. That is not a right now problem. Silly goose. But yeah, here's that knife once again. I even uh, stippled the blade. Right, so an hour and 55 minutes where I'm just done with my sign. <laughs> Got to do uh, full blown Niji surgery while this laser from the flying bird is doing its job. Oh, you're using the flying bear? Oh, yeah. yeah. I was asking him questions about it earlier. He's got it all set up. Nice. All right. So, this is going to be interesting because I have a riser on this laser. So, I I needed to raise that up to get a focal point. I don't know if I can actually go low enough without keeping. All right, I'm bottomed out on my tower. How freaking far away? Yeah, the lowest I can go from lens to, uh, to, to work area, and this is with a fixture bed on it is like 270 millimeters. That's that's going to get in the way. Oh, let's see. We got it going on. Thank you again for sending those, Rob. I'm about to make very good use of them. You don't have the uh, Z table either? Um, actually, I do. I have to find it, but I have one. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I have to have one for both my ladies because the UV, the 70 millimeter lens will not reach the bed. Well, and since I put risers on my fiber so I can use my 100, my 110 won't reach the bed. Since uh, since everybody here's been hanging out for for a couple hours, I'll uh, I'll give you a sneak preview, aud audibly because I'm, I'm not unboxing it right now. But uh, if you haven't seen it, go check out. Uh, there's videos for it online. It's called the Index with two X's. I N D E X X. It is essentially a uh, it's a rotary axis but flat. And I don't mean a rotary table. It is, a, it's functionally an X, an X table. That's like four feet long. Um, oh, is that like the one that they had at, uh, at OBX? It is the exact exactly. one they had at OBX. Yeah. Oh, okay. Nice. That thing is um, so I won't have those focal point problems pretty soon. Cause that's going to end up on this bed. Yeah. Um, that was a couple, like what? Five, six inches tall um something like that um but i'm my goal is to basically be able to utilize it across a bunch of mis machines yeah it's an it's an x axis table so uh think like rotary okay so you can set it up like a rotary but instead of rotational movement it's flat movement across one axis like the laser pad kind of yeah so Essentially, if you had a long enough uh, X table uh, with enough motion, you could have an infinite X work area. Your your limitation would be your lens size for your width, your uh, height, but your width would be the length of your X axis. Um, I don't have a link at the moment. I'll grab you one when I sit back down. One sec. the box oh, you got the XYZ. yep all right let me find the link yeah so height won't be a problem um my problem will be not enough height because if i'm sticking stuff on top of that it's it's not you know yeah, you i might tower. not have enough tower it's not a conveyor. It's not a conveyor. Um, though there are industrial solutions for stuff like that. But yeah, I'll I'll link it. Hold on. And I'll be doing an unboxing for it. Um, it's in uh, round two of pre-order at the moment, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell anybody to purchase it because I haven't had my hands on other than the outside of the box. But there's the link to the the website if you want to see what it looks like. Um, those are the parts that it comes with, and then the third image is the actual like machine with all the, the stuff that goes with it on top of it. It was very cool. You were able to get your hands on this, man. Huh? I said, it's very cool. You were able to get your hands on this. Yeah. My, uh, my problem at the moment is I'm in the process of like shifting my shop around and like reorganizing things. Um, so that I have enough space to the left and right of all the machines I want to plug it into that I'm not like ramming it through a window <laughs> or uh, into a wall while I'm using it. Um, Cause obviously it has to be able to extend like three and a half feet off of each side of the laser. Yep. So um, great for production work, depending on what you're trying to produce in theory. 
But uh, I'm going to go back to <sighs> impromptuly unboxing this uh, XYZ table. I'd really love to remove... I'm going to remove my name. There we go. I'm going to remove my name so it's not blocking half of my, my view for you guys. So... Oh, well, that's whack. What? The next XYZ table. Oh, I have to remove a spacer because my x-axis uh limit switch is still buried inside the frame so it can't get hit oh. i don't know what i did with my other knife but i got my main turtle warrior knife so i got that going for me There's your there's your solution for the day. Your pro tip beyond lens correction. Your shop tip for the day is just keep extra knives everywhere. So when you lose one, you have a spare close by. I have a spot on my shelf that is just a pile of knives. It's like a, a literal pile. I, I like keep one on every workbench, basically. One at my desk, one at this workbench, one at my other workbench, one by my 3D printer. It's just, it's how it goes. This is some like hey, industrially thick plastic wrap. Hey Kyle. Yo dog. Do you think everybody that's watching right now signed up for the LMA? Uh statistically speaking, no. Me neither. But if you guys are enjoying the content and you like this kind of stuff and you want us to be able to keep doing it. You can sign up to support Laser Everything over at masters.lasereverything.net. Yeah. So this XY table came with my CO2 Galvo from Hey Ocean. Um, it is 210 millimeters wide by 150 deep. And sitting flat... It's a uh, hair under 90 millimeters tall, which is perfect because I think that's about how much rise I need. Oh, yeah, that's beautiful. If I'm not mistaken, what size are you doing? This is a 110. Oh, yeah, There's a 110, and I have a 200 millimeter tower riser on this laser, so yeah, it's a a wee bit tight. So I need a 236. The lenses are big enough now that I can only do one test at a time before retaping, which is sad. Oh no. I don't know how I'm going to do this. 300, I'm going to have to find a different piece of material to put down because this is not going to be big enough. I may have to troubleshoot this, the my big focal stick with Rob because I when I tighten the thumb screw, it doesn't stop it from sliding. Oh, bummer. Yeah. Rob, if you can hear me, I might need tech support. Maybe the threading on the back side. It might be. Yeah. We'll see. You could always just slap says, a little tape on it. He says, I can help you with it. Oh, nice. Thank you, Rob. And you reminded Jack in the shop that he needs to renew his LMA subscription. Oh, thanks, Jack. And I, I validated, too, in case you were curious about the uh, the precision. I don't know if you guys can see the numbers. There we go. I 
camera is going a little laggy through Wi-Fi, but uh, I set it to 236, which is the height I need. And I validated with the roller. It is spot on. So it is very accurate. But for now, I'm going to pinch it. Calm down, Jimmy. <laughs> Brutal. Satan rest his soul. So this is the Y-axis limit switch here, and it just barely poked through enough, but the X isn't making it through the frame. So I'm going to pull, I think, just these nuts. You're going to pull those nuts? <laughs> I was really hoping you weren't paying attention to that. The second it came out of my mouth, I was like, this. It came out of your mouth? Here. Oh, my God. Stop. Wait, uh, I want to see. Hold on. Show me again. Let me see. Oh. I just walked away from the table so I could look. Oh, it's, uh, I don't even know if I was holding it up to the right spot to begin with, but oh, I'm losing stuff left and right now. Um, the board attaches with these screws here, and right. these nuts, I think, are the difference of what's keeping the limit switch from making it through the frame, because this is the limit switch here, and there's a finger on the X-axis that Much comes lower. in and hits that, so... Yeah. <clears throat> I need to go collect some pieces that fell. Just be careful yeah. about those spacers. Might be insulators, bro. Uh, there's an insulator pad on the back of it. Oh, okay. I think that... Oh, no. I'm leaving the spacers anyways. I'm uh, I'm taking the nuts off. Oh. Uh, Denutting it. God damn. Giving it the old guys, Bob Barker. You know what I'm saying? Can you can you guys tell the stream's almost over? Because I can. <laughs> uh, there might be some sawdust in it. Thought I got it all cleaned out. Um, so basically, uh, am I going to screw it up if I unscrew it all the way and then hit it with some compressed air? And then screw it back together? Would that be... An appropriate fix. All right, I'm moving on to scale. All right, test. cool. So I'll, I'll give that a shot then. I'm just getting myself prepped here with my my 110 test here. I actually need to. Uh, grab a piece of my flat stock. Because I actually don't need that. I need this guy. I need some tape. So I need to do my lens correction. Boom. Success. Dude, I love this yeah. laser so much. God, do this spot on. I've never gotten an X value just like perfect out of the gate. One ten lens, we got more than enough. Yeah, 
Uh, what did chat say? Let's get caught up here. The black part is two sections that can be pulled apart. Screws removed. It's made in a way where it will still be right even if completely taken apart. Cool. All right. So I'm going to pull that apart. I'll hit it with a little compressed air. And that'll, uh, we'll see if that sorts it out. Dude, no scale adjustment on the 150. That's the first time I've ever seen that. Uh, good. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's good. So that there's our X axis number switch. And she will take it through. It's not no catching. So, boom. Success. I gotta be honest with you, Anthony. This is some bullshit I would literally never do. I like this thing would be in the it would be in the trash, bro. But I love my diodes. I know, I know you do. I would just get like even if I loved that laser, if it was my favorite laser in the world, I'd just get another one. I wouldn't be fucking <laughs> I can do wiring and shit, but you're like on some other shit with that right now. This is that automotive tech school tech school degree shining yeah, through right is. now? Absolutely. All right, there it is. There's my my focal stick taken apart. I'm just gonna blow this off. I think we'll uh, we'll keep on the trend here for spot size. Maybe get a little uh, little point oh four. Um, so keep keep maybe. the trend going. Yeah, I mean that would be probably what I'd expect. <laughs> This is the 175. Yeah. <clears throat> Back here. Can you hear me all right? My headphones died. You're okay. If anything, this is better. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. Okay. Lock that down. So, yeah, that's that's much better. It's holding better. It's got better friction and not sliding. Friction. It's time to do lens correction. It's not echoing or anything. Is it going through my laptop? Nope. Nope. You're good, dude. You're Gucci. I'm telling you, I think this is the best you've sounded all night. Yeah. So we got our core file cleared. Sorry, I muted my mic because uh, there was an exorbitant amount of noise outside. Um, so we're, we're back in Lightburn here. We got our core file cleared. We hit OK to make sure it's not there anymore. We go back. It's not there. We can close it. Laser tools. Calibrate. Nine point. We're going to correct this as a 110. The best part about having all these spot sizes recorded is when we go to do photos, we'll just have permanent values. 
Yeah. More or less. I mean, obviously, like, the material, the dot size will change a bit, but we'll have really, really strong starting points at the very least. Yep. I don't remember what values I was using to do this, so I'm just freeballing it on that. We're going to find out if it works. That is way bigger than 110. I'm going to have to throw a little more tape on that side. Yeah, that is significantly bigger than 110 millimeters, by the way. It's 160. <laughs> so, I bet you the corners are going to get cut off on this. Try this again. Dude, that is spot on. Point oh four, dude. I need a sanity check with myself here. Maybe I screwed up my focal height. Hold on. We're just going to do it from scratch again.
It's not marking. Okay. I need to restart my laser. Did he just say we have a Niji? Yeah, she's alive. It's hey, alive. It is alive. She blinded me with science. See, this is kind of what makes me think it's This is the one I'm gonna hang and see if I can engrave on the wall. Let's just let's try it. So we can hold itself up. A lot of these newer diodes, they put like the motors hold tension, so you you don't you can't just manually move them around if you have power. That's one cool feature of the, the flying bears. You can actually unlock the motors so you can manually position the laser head somewhere on the bed and then relock them. Mm -hmm. kind of Live action. Yeah, I was off by a lot. Go get your phone, Anthony. It's actually going through my laptop, sorry. I thought it was close enough. Oh, it's all good. We could, more or less. So what's the status? She's running. I didn't fire it because I don't have anything to put under it. And this is I mean, it, it homed, right? That's kind of the point. Yeah, it homed and it framed, so we're good. We're... I had the origin set to the correct uh, position, so you know that saved me. Yep. So for all you kids out there with Niji diodes, the origin is bottom left corner, even though your homing position is the top left. Corner. So it homes at zero on the X and 460 on the Y. That's bizarre. Yeah, I know. That's what screwed me up when I was trying to redo my profiles. And it just took one time of it bouncing off that limit switch because I don't know. Da, 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 da. I was very off with my measured focal distance. There you go. By like 50 millimeters, which explains oh why it wasn't God. marking. Yeah, I must have typed in the numbers wrong. That'll do it. That will do. Try this again. Uh, 
I can't not know. <sighs> So if I hit stop, Oh, yeah. There we go. Still here, Vince. Danny. Let's see what orientation was that in? Tail to the right, face pointing down. Well, I'm going to have to bail soon, Kyle. Do you want to finish up this project on stream? or? Yeah, I'll finish up this lens correction. All right, cool. Well, uh, let me move to a camera where I can at least say goodbye to everybody in a normal way. I'm going to leave you guys with Kyle and get home to my kids because uh, it's getting to be kids' bedtime. But uh, really good progress today. Uh, sixty-six percent of our UV lasers lenses have been set up and are completely configured. So that's really great news. Um, there's a lot more to go. We have uh, two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven fiber lenses left, and two, four, six CO2 galgo lenses left. And I'll probably want to do the fiber laser lenses on the SFX2, which we'll have to set up. So that's technically another 11. So uh, there's a lot more to do, but um, that's really, really good progress. I went ahead and installed the 220 millimeter lens in the UV. So when I come back in, I'll start with that one. Uh, you guys will probably miss it. I may do the 300 without you too. Um, <laughs> But I don't know, maybe next time we'll jump back over to the CO2 Galvo and try to pull that out a little better. Because that's the part of the spreadsheet. I'm sure you guys can see it on the screen. I guess it's over there. Uh, that's the part of the spreadsheet that is looking a little thin now. And then once we kind of wrap up the specialty lasers, we can get down into the fiber and kind of start working on that. Because I haven't touched that at all yet other than filling out source details. Um, but yeah, really, really, really good progress. We got a lot done today. Feeling super good about it. Uh, but like I said, I'm going to leave you with Kyle to figure, uh, 
look to finish up his configuration. And uh, thanks for hanging out with us today. Don't forget to go sign up for the Laser Master Academy. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to do this. You can find that over at masters.lasereverything.net. Go check out the new website. Let me know what you think of it. I tried to clean it up and simplify it a little bit so things were easier to find. Um, it's pretty basic now, uh, but I think that's what people wanted. So um, I tried to kind of really simplify that and make it easier to navigate. Leave me some feedback on that. Don't forget to smash the like button and leave a comment after the stream is over so other people can find this stream and learn something from it too. Uh, but yeah, that's all I think I've got. So I'm going to take off and, uh, like I said, get home to my kids, see the wife, uh, provide a little relief. Anthony, thanks for hanging out, bro. Thanks for having me, man. Good seeing you. Yeah, of course, dude. You too. And uh, I will see you guys in the next one. Have fun with Kyle and Anthony. And if you're just joining... I am about halfway through a lens correction on my 110 lens. And then I'll be doing a red dot adjust. All right, Lori's asking in chat, and I just want to clarify before I answer, but uh, the stream today is in lieu of a podcast episode tonight, correct? That is correct, yes. Just wanted to double check before I said anything out of pocket. Yep, you are... You are good, my man. So, yeah. Sorry, Lori. We covered a lot of good talking points today, though. Lots of good information. Yeah. If you so go if back you do, and watch. If you do scroll back, there is uh, an infinite wealth of uh, cool stuff that we chatted about. One thing I learned today is Alex has 900 F beta lenses. I did not know. Pretty that. much, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> he agreed. So he did four lenses and he's 66% done with. So that's one what, laser. Six, with one laser. Six UV laser or lenses, which is wild. And then 11. He must have some duplicates then with the fibers. Oh, he does, yeah. Okay. I think he has like four 110 lenses. So this was my little project I was working on while I was performing surgery on the Niji. Just a little sign. I'm going to I'm gonna spray some clear on it to seal it and then spray some white spray paint for some contrast or maybe blue. But... I have an 80 watt CO2 I can't fit through the door yet. I have to turn it on inside. So some days I spend working at home and I just want people to be able to reach me. I'm not here. Being reachable is very important as a as a business, right? Yeah, for sure. I get phone calls all the time when I'm working at home and it's like, hey, I came by and nobody was there. So I just I want people to not be under the impression that I closed. So. Yeah. So what I'm going to do here is take a screenshot so that I have that those values saved. But I'm going to go ahead and hit next. We're done. I'm just going to validate that they did indeed get input. I'm just referencing my screenshot here on the right. You can see the scale is set, the bulge, axis two being the x axis, 85, 1965, 19996. So cool. So now we can validate this. So I'm going to click OK. And I'm going to make a box. We're going to make that a. I'm going to make it 90 so it doesn't line up with the other existing box. Center. Do 1,000 speed, 20 power, 30. Because why not? And frame that up. Just 
want to make sure we are in the ballpark. Hey, Vinny, what brand of uh, dial laser do you have that when you hit stop it on the And I just shot this with a clear so that when I go and hit it with spray paint, it doesn't bleed between the tape and the wood and give you fuzzy or lined edges. So my scale is indeed off. So my x-axis is measuring 92.2. So if you guys haven't seen a scale correction in Lightburn before, I will go back here. So we have a 90 millimeter square that we expected. If we go to our device settings, I measured my x-axis. These three little dots right here, requested size, we want to put 90. And I measured 92.2. Oh, and get the crap you can out of see. Here. Yeah, you haven't seen this? Is that new? Uh it snuck in there since it was in beta. No, oh, so, okay. Yeah, I have a video in editing right now, full lens setup in Lightburn from start to finish. And this this got included, but uh, it's in editing. But you can see current scale and then adjusted scale. So this should bring it back closer to where it should be. I'm just going to check my y-axis really quick. It's funny because I was going to ask you if you had like a formula, like a X over 100 equals blah, 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 whatever uh, that you use. But. There, is, there is a formula <clears throat> if you wanted to do it manually. Um, this is just way easier, though. Yeah, light, light burns got our backs, bro. And my Y axis is low at 88.22. 88.22. So I go up here to the Y because this this one's the X, marked as X. We wanted 90. We got 88.22. <coughs> and what I'm going to do now is yet again resize this, actually, because I'm lazy. We're going to do 100 by 100 frame. We're going to go mark that. How's your project going, Anthony? I'm just about done. I'm thinking my wife's at home waiting for me, maybe. She was going to go grocery shopping, so I'll check in with her and see if I need to cut out, too. Yeah, I'm just about done here as well. So I'm going to go ahead and mark that. Oh, man, that camera is really laggy on the Wi-Fi. All right. I'm going to go measure it, and we should have a 100 millimeter square. And if we don't, we can set the scale again. Sometimes it takes a couple attempts if it's really far off. One hundred. Beautiful. And 100. So that's it. So what I can do now, the only other thing left to do, I'm going to make a smaller square so I can fit it somewhere. And I'm going to align my red dot. So if we... All right, now we just want to look and see, whoop, come back here, if the red dot is aligned. That looks pretty good from what I can see. It is spot on, actually. Nice. Which is great because I actually utilized my red dot correction that I did on the 200. But if this was too small, I'll go back to Lightburn here, or too big, well, or it needed to shift. Yeah, you just go to device settings, and you can shift it. 
hit OK, and then frame it again and see if it if it's lined up now. As long as you don't move what you marked, you can use it as an ongoing, like, shift the red dot, see if it lines up, shift the red dot, see if it lines up. But, yeah. So that was uh, that was my 110 lens all corrected. Yeah. Now, quick question. <clears throat> yeah. Um, with your your source is a 60 watt JPT. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that usually has a built in red dot. Is is it typically off since it runs down the fiber stream, or is it usually pretty accurate? It does have a built in red dot, but it actually is utilizing a beam combined one. Oh, okay. So right. normally if it's built in, it would be, if it's not spot on, it would be very close. Sometimes it does shift, but it does follow the fiber optic cable is my understanding when it's built into the source. So, but if it's beam combined in, um, cause I have both, um, it does, uh, it does shift it. And this is the SFX? No, this one's the wisely. Oh, the wisely. Okay. I wonder why they put in a beam combiner if it had one in the source that's interesting. It is way brighter. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the built-in one can can be a little dim. And then also, because the red dots, they do have a finite life to them, uh, counted in hours, um, every once in a while you have to get it swapped or serviced. And when it's built into the, the source, it's just not realistic. No, there you um, go. So... Just having an extra beam combiner in there so you can swap the red dot when it dies on you is uh, is really nice. Yeah, that sounds that's a great answer to my question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I see Vince was talking about uh, worked on the Orter on Tech K40 and another one I don't recall the brand of. The other one is the Soval SO2. Yeah. Speaking of that. Soval, you're into 3D printing a bit, right? Yeah, I have a uh, FL Sun QQS or something like that. It's a it's one of those Delta printers. Yep, yep. I have uh, it's a Trudon 2.0 350 millimeter. It's a 350 by 350 by 350 build area, and I just ordered the upgrade kit for Clipper. Kyle, will you be doing a video on adding red framing light to your UV? Uh, yes, I will. Um, I just ordered the upgrade kit for that 3D printer, so I gotta I gotta mess with that when that comes in. But that'll be a week or two. Um, but I was just checking out the Soval SV08. I didn't even realize they were coming out with another printer, and I saw a live stream this morning. Um, that looks like a pretty compelling printer too. If you're just getting started thinking about taking a look at that but we'll see so Vinny's soval is that a 3d printer with the laser built into it or i don't know it? or do they make standard lasers I, wonder. I think they had some engravers like uh yeah. some diode engravers as well mike c says the store soval voron clone looks nice yeah i mean it's it's kind of a clone but it's not really a clone because it's open source the Voron is open source, but they're also open sourcing their thing. It's kind of like a mix. It's interesting. Okay, so this is a standalone. Yeah, five watt gantry. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, it looks like a compelling offer. I paid it was it was close to a thousand dollars, if if not just a hair over for my Trudon. Um The Soval one, the the word on the street is under six hundred, according to the posts I've seen, which would be a really compelling offer for the same build volume, and for a printer that comes tuned. Whereas with the Trudon, it was more like a Voron experience minus the forty hours of build time. So, not really a gantry; it's a cantilever. Okay, that makes sense. So it's kind of like the um, the Atom Stack M7. Yeah, similar. Like the, the original or tours. Well, the or tour, they're uh, what's their off brand? Off Arrow uh, still has uh, 
Isn't it all feral? Yeah, it's not. It's like their, it's their product category. They have the Ofero, yes. they have the Laser Master, and they have. Uh, there's another one I forget. But yeah. Uh, based off of Warren, they're donating two dollars to the Warren Project for each printer. That's awesome, because I would love to see some more innovation come from the Voron guys. Um, and if they have that that cash flow, hopefully that helps them with their development, because they they don't get paid; they do that for free. They're just a bunch of dedicated dudes. Jack says he pulled his beam combiner when he put his 100 watt in and pulled out his 30. So, well, at least you have a beam combiner if your built in goes dead on you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's probably going to last you a while, but every once in a while we hear, we hear somebody who's their red dot, their built in red dot died after a couple of months. Yeah. Um, I hear on Discord when people ask questions on there sometimes, they're, Built ins are fuzzy. And uh, yeah, we've recommended to a few people that they grab a bean combiner because they can't yeah. really feel the fuzziness of the, <laughs> the built in unit. So, no, that's the downside to a, like a really dim red dot is you don't really feel like you're getting a really fine point sometimes if it's too dim. Um, it, it just, it, it's, such a low power essentially when it's turned down that it you're not getting a fine point it's just it gets blurry at the edges yeah well i th i think that's it for me i finished up my 110 lens i already did my timing and delay for this laser so and i have my focal point now so i'm all set for tonight i will proceed another day with alex uh, I think you can turn the internal ones off with the RS-232 and the operating system software, but the software is hard to come by. I don't have a copy. Uh, generally speaking, you need to you need to be basically registered as a vendor, I think, to get the software to talk to each of the, the lasers. So, like, JPT has their own software. Max has their own software. Rekus has their own software. Ingu has their own software, et cetera. Um, and then the RS, so the RS-232 is basically just the interface to get your computer to talk to the source directly because there's a controller in the source. Um, oh, if I can. But, uh, yeah. If I can reach, I think I can. On the back of my UV, you can see that port because the source is exposed. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes if you talk to the, the vendor where you bought it from, you can get a copy. Or or if you're having trouble with your laser, I got point down just a hair. Oh, yeah, right there. There's your RS-232. So that's your troubleshooting port. But, yeah, you can. You can indeed turn that off. Some models you can turn the brightness up and down. So you got some options there. Um <laughs> So there's a port like that in the fiber source? There is, yeah. There's a port on that for pretty much any any source, essentially. Uh, some of them are male and some of them are female as well. So one RS-232 isn't, isn't always the answer. Sometimes you need the other version of it. Uh, Alex actually needed to order a different one, I think, or might have needed to order one. I don't remember. Yeah, uh, actually, I got one that came with the 50 watt cloud ray. They send them out proactively now. So if if there is a need to troubleshoot, they just you already have it. You have everything you need, unless you need like a hardware replacement, which is cool. I think more idea. brands should. I'm gonna start giving that as feedback for more brands because it's like a dollar fifty for the cable, and mm -hmm. if they're shipping it with the laser, it's not gonna change your shipping price. Um, it's like a half an ounce or an ounce. Yeah. on a on an 80 or 90 or 100 pound machine so yeah, yeah um it just makes sense and i think 
waiting for that to ship with a machine for a week or more some sometimes coming from another country could could really screw you up yeah especially if you're dead in the water and trying to run a business so that's that's good on cloud ready to do that proactively it's working. yeah mike c says wisely did it with their uh uv good i'm glad to see that they're including that Software was on the USB two. Oh, interesting. Well, that's that's all I got. You all done for the night? Yeah, yeah. I got all the projects I need done. I got a plethora of these. It's funny, as as Alex was saying that the UV isn't the right, uh, or Galvo machines aren't the right machines for cutting. I was cutting with mine. <laughs> they still do it. They still do yeah. it. And it, you don't really lose. There's not a lot of deformation. So, because I'm using the 150 lens and it's a it, really small area in the center. Like, the further out, obviously, you go toward the edge, you're going to get more deformation. So, Yo, yeah, it'll ramp more. Yeah, when I was cutting the silver uh, lapel pins for this company, I noticed with my 110 cutting through, it was like 1.8 millimeter sterling silver. I would yep. get tapering. So, I had to send those flat. But, yeah, I'm good to go, All right. Good to hang with you guys. I appreciate it. Yeah. Learn a lot. Uh, thank you for you guys hanging out in chat. Uh, as Alex mentioned before, if you love what we do and hanging out with us and you appreciate sharing the knowledge and you want to support what we do, check out the Laser Master Academy. It's the number one way to support our team and our efforts and our projects and uh, the ability for us to spend our time doing this every day. Um, and if you want to join any of our other communities, they're free. There's the Discord and the Facebook group where you can ask questions, get help, and look through information. It is a huge wealth of knowledge. And subscribe if you haven't. If you love the live stream, hit the bell icon so you get notified the next time we go live or upload a video. And uh, yeah, that's all I got. If you guys are into doing coins on the Discord, we're doing a monthly coin challenge. This month is 80s movies is the theme. So if you've got some coin blanks laying around and you have the inclination to whip up a design, the rules are it has to be no artificial intelligence assistance and uh, just an original design that you make. So you can see the results yeah. from last month's competition. We didn't really do the official voting properly this past month because it was the first time, but if you want to join in on it and uh, and have a little friendly competition, then you're more than welcome to join us on the Discord under Coin Challenge, and we'll see you there. Sounds good to me. I'm looking forward to seeing those uh, submissions. Yep, me too, for sure. All right. Well, and uh, check out Anthony's channel too. He's been uploading stuff. Uh, if it's not linked below, I'll link it. If he's not going to shout it out, I'm going to. <laughs> appreciate it so check that out as well um and we'll see you guys in the next one have a great night good night everybody <laughs>